All right, wake up, folks. New tile just dropped. I'm not fully joking. They did find a new tile. Now, when you say mathematicians discovered a new thing, of course, you got to note that the shape existed. The shape was there in the continuum of possible knowledge to get. But mathematicians have discovered out of that continuum more shapes with interesting properties. It came at a pretty funny time. The last stream I did was about a completely unrelated shape, something for the upcoming combo class episode that I am finishing editing and I hope to have out tonight but could be out tomorrow, depending on how long it takes me to make sure I get my audio right, my title cards right and such. But when I was describing this completely unrelated shape that we were making, the complicated shape we drew in our last stream, somebody asked, is it the Einstein tile, the complicated shape your thing is referring to? By the Einstein tile, they meant this new-ish shape that had been discovered by mathematicians, proven that it could aperiodically tile the plane. And we will go into what that means in a moment. And I noted in the stream that, no, it's not about that, but here's a little rant about what that means. It might be a future episode. It's really cool. They found that recently, but they have not found a version that can tile the plane only aperiodically without requiring its flipped copy, a mirror image of it. And after the stream, within an hour, I came across an article that was about a brand... Oh, squirrel. Squirrel up there. I don't know if you folks care about squirrels like I do, but I find them neat. Got a little visitor. Maybe it'll come back. Uh, within an hour of that stream, I read an article that was about... Okay... Within the past few days, this is a discovery that the first paper, I believe, was about four days ago from now. So maybe the preprint, this is all the preprint of the paper, may have been out by the time I made that last stream, maybe a day or two before. But the first articles being written about it were like right about the time I finished that stream. And I came across an article that came out right after I finished the stream about how you know, a couple days ago, they proved that there's another shape that does aperiodically tile it without needing the flip copy. The exact thing I said was missing from the discovery in the last stream. So today I want to go down a little rabbit hole where first I'm going to talk about what type of mathematical discoveries could still be open. What does it mean to discover something in the modern era of math? Then we're going to go into my little prequel of a possible future episode I'll make that I'm going to do the prequel now because I want to share the fun news that just came out about what it means to be an aperiodic tiling. Then once I have you folks relatively on my level of uh, being ready to jump in with me, into reading about the new one. I haven't read much about the new one myself. I kn I've read the crucial details of a few traits it has regarding what you could call chirality, uh, its flip versus itself. But I want to get you folks up to speed on my level to a degree so that we can read the new paper that came out. Now, we're not going to understand it all and we're going to skim it a bit. But I, the new paper that came out does have some cool pictures, some cool demonstrations of what it takes to prove something. And so after I give you an intro of what it means to be aperiodic and such, we're going to look at the article for one of my first times. I've read this article once and didn't fully understand it. So I'm going to need to do a little more research before I perform a full combo class episode about this topic. You know, I'm not going to put out a full episode until I know I got my data right and that I have a unique presentation on it that hasn't been captured before. But in this case, as opposed to going toward mastery of the subject, we're going toward this is a brand new discovery. What does it mean to find something brand new in math? 
And let's first start with that. Well, real quick, let me say hello to everyone in the comments. I love you all. Thanks so much. Let's have this be one of our biggest streams. The streams have been kind of growing in viewers, and they are not nearly as promoted as my other types of content. But if we all stick around and enjoy this little journey, maybe this will be our biggest stream yet. Now, what does it mean to discover something in math? Well, funny enough, it ties into some of the recent combo class episodes that I have, the one I'm editing to come out tonight or tomorrow, and the ones that I am brainstorming to possibly film next. But I guess that's usual, because an interest of mine is simple unsolved questions. So it's not a big surprise those would show up as almost a core thesis of some episodes. In fact, the next episode on the Combo Class channel, funny enough, is unrelated to the aperiodic tilings we'll talk about today. But it is going to be called something about how it's a simple unsolved question that may never be solved for this one, but a very simple unsolved question in mathematics that's still open. So if you were way back in the day, here's a couple transcripts that I'm still going to fully read through of one of the original math authors that we still quote and use the works of in a written form, Euclid. Around in the era, you'd still call it BCs. Not positive, but I think it was a few hundred years BC, which means it was about 2,300 years ago. 2400 maybe somewhere in that range Euclid was around and the reason it takes three books to write what could have been one book from there is that the language they used was much different the language evolved over time and so you need a lot of translations of what Euclid really meant by all of his descriptions how the things he said were proofs could be considered proofs in our modern standards, but you need to translate many terms. So, for example, the core difference is that back in this day, they didn't even see numbers as like, I have this integer three, I have this integer 12. They saw them as distances. So when Euclid was trying to prove there was an infinite amount of primes, which he was the first quoted author, I believe, to prove the infinitude of the primes. It wasn't about like, there's these numbers with this quality. Like what's a number? To him, a number meant a length, kind of like this is twice as long as that. That represents two. And so he was almost trying to prove things about which lengths could divide other lengths. But as you go forward, there's seemingly less unsolved questions, but also, oh, the squirrel's back. Oh, you can't see it right there. It's right around the corner. Squirrel. Look at that little fellow. So these squirrels are younger. This is like, uh, they had some kids. There's a couple siblings of squirrels, some younger ones <laughs> that like to play around a bunch. And they haven't gotten soured on the human experience. You know, maybe these older squirrels, somebody stepped on their tail once. Maybe a car revved right by them. They got scared of humans. These younger squirrels, they're not as jaded. So they'll play around the classroom more and we'll get extra cameos. And they will learn. I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not going to. I'll be careful with my clocks when a squirrel's around. Yeah, I'm chaotic, but the animals still come around. Now... Thank you to everyone joining. When someone's asking, when do we tile the plane? We're not literally going to be tiling the plane. We are going to be looking at articles that prove things today. We will be doing it in my casual chaotic method. So this won't be a computer program where I draw something along the lines of an aperiodic tiling. But we're going to go on a little journey of what it means to discover something and what they discovered. So, although there may be less things open in math, because, you know, we've proven there's infinite primes and such, 
each of those things raises new questions. And although the new questions would have been harder for Euclid to answer, the terminology and the methodology of teaching gets better. And we get these groundworks for like, okay, now we have all these number theory rules versus this type of theory rules. And as the questions get harder, the tools get easier to use and we get better tools. So it is still certainly possible to find an unsolved question, whether it's something that was asked long ago or even a question you asked yourself and solve it. Now, I don't think that I, in my lifetime, am going to be the one to write a formal proof about anything, but I have all these ideas in my notebook that I am going to start revealing to the public, and maybe me along with someone else will come to some cool conclusion. One cool conclusion that recently was found was people playing around with which shapes can tile the plane. Now, not long ago on the Combo Class channel, I did an episode about bananas being related to hexagons. And in that episode, it happened to relate to hexagonal tilings. So I covered the fact that there are only three regular polygons that can tile a plane or like fill it all in without gaps. And those are, we can do an example of squares right here because I got some cubes in the form of dice. And so let's look at the top of these cubes as squares. Now, we can obviously get the sense that it's possible to tile a plane using squares. It's like a square grid. I could just keep going on forever. By tile a plane, we mean we want to keep using this shape or set of shapes to keep going and to not have any gaps. We're never going to hit a gap. So this is what's called a periodic tiling. And it's kind of technical to fully describe how you do, you know, prove what, what do we want from periodic. But in some sense, what we can say is that there's no arbitrarily large chunk of my tiling. Arbitrarily large, meaning like bigger than any number you could pick. So there's no super close to infinity large chunk of my tiling that can be translated over and or rotated. Well, no, actually, it's just translation for this part. There's no sector of it that can be translated over and get the same thing. We need things that are uneven in some way. Now, I could make the squares uneven. I could just have each row like a multiple of pi from the last and they're never going to hit each other on where each of these rows are. So I could make an aperiodic tiling, meaning not periodic. There's not a big stretch of it I can shift over and get a same copy. If I did like powers of pi or something weird on this going up. However, there are periodic tilings. So when we say an aperiodic tile, we're actually going to mean some shape that it can tile the plane without gaps, but its only way of tiling the plane are methods without gaps. It can have more than one way, that's okay, but any method it can have to tile the plane must be aperiodic, meaning we cannot shift a big scale and get a copy. Like the square grid, we could shift any part of it and get a copy. That is super periodic. But we can also, you know, of course, make our tilings with other regular polygons, as I showed. We can do equilateral triangles or regular hexagons, also tile the plane. But those are periodic, too. I can shift them over. So what is an aperiodic tiling that has to be aperiodic? Well... It, when I make a full episode about this, we're going to have to flash back a bit because there's a thing called Penrose tilings. Let's show the screen right here for a moment. This is Penrose, an example of a Penrose tiling. There are, you know, other types that requires two tiles. There are two simple tiles that in combination can tile the plane, but the only ways you can combine them to tile the plane 
are aperiodic. They do weird little different places where these things show up, and it's it's not a predictable patch. Now, that was a great discovery. But when they found that, like, 30, 40 years ago, or actually, no, now it's got to be 60 years ago or something. I guess it says in the 70s here, so that'd be about 50 years ago. So, when they found that, it was really cool, but it takes two tiles. They wondered, is there one tile, a mono tile? Which is why these things got the nickname Einstein tiles. It's not related to the mathematician Einstein. The word root of Ein, one. Stein, stone. One, stone. So, the, when you hear them called the Einstein tiles, it's really the one stone tiles in an original language. It's not about the dude Einstein. Now, this took two tilings. So, or two tiles to tile it infinitely. But could we do it with one? They wondered that for years. Is there an aperiodic, which we need to remember doesn't mean can make an aperiodic tiling. By an aperiodic tile, we're going to mean that any tiling it can make is aperiodic. So, like a otherwise... It would be quite easy to even just misalign squares, like I said, by some like transcendental numbers, powers or whatever, that you could make an aperiodic tiling with most, if not all, of the things that can tile. But can we make it with the other thing? Now, okay, I actually think I should go in and grab a board game I have. This sounds absurd, but recently... Uh, my family likes board games sometimes, and one of the newer ones involves a bunch of what I, Okay, the game is based on Tetris. They call them Tetriminos. Don't trust them. They're called Tetrominos. They're trying to brand this toward Tetris or something. The shapes they're talking about that I kind of want to... I'm going to run and grab and get these. Are, they're called Tetrominos. That's the mathematical definition. They're part of a thing called polyominoes. When I was a kid, I loved the pentominoes. I still do. Pentominoes, there are 12 of them. If you, and what it means is, how many ways in a square grid can I connect cells? So like, the pentominoes are all the ways I can connect five cells in a grid. That's a pentomino, if I like flatten it. That's a pentomino. That's a, not a different one if I count flipping, because I can flip that one into this one. Uh, you know, this is a different one. This P-like thing. It's like, in a square-like grid, how many ways can I make little chunks that are a certain amount of units? Now, here's the funny thing about polyominoes. I've talked about pentominoes as being, like, underrated. But the under ones, well, okay, the triominoes are underrated. There are two triominoes. One is you can have three in a line. One is you can have this curved one. Now, I guess maybe if you don't count flipping, there might be three triominoes. I'd have to look if that flips into the other or not. So if you call them fixed, then that sometimes, or there are different terms for these polyominoes to mean, do we allow flipping or not? The classic set of pentominoes does allow flipped copies to be the same, so you don't get two copies of if it's flipped. And then there are 12 ways of connecting five cells. The cool thing about pentominoes is that, so there are 12 with five cells, and although five seems not that divisible, 12 times five is 60, a really divisible number. And they're kind of magical in how many ways, yet how hard it is to do any of the ways you can create them into rectangles or even cubes if you have little, uh, or I mean cubic-like prisms, if you have pentominoes. Now, all my pentominoes are buried in the classroom and stuff. I left my set out here. My, I, I need to buy a new set of pentominoes. They are scattered to the classroom. But I do have a lot of tetrominoes in the form of a board game that calls them tetriminoes. The thing I was going to say is funny is that 
the monomino you never talk about, the triominoes you never talk about, the pentominoes you never talk about, except if you're a cool recreational mathematician. But the tetrominoes, a lot of people know from Tetris. What about the two ones? What about the ones that are a two omino? Well, what's a word root for two? Like duomino? Like a domino? Yep, the word root domino is along the same family of pentomino and tetromino. It is one of the polyominoes, and its word name even follows the structure. A domino is the one and only way of combining two cells of squares in a square grid as one shape. Once you get to the triominoes, you get more than one option. Now, I'm going to actually grab these tetrominoes. They're going to be useful as a visual tool. So let me grab some tetrominoes. I'll be back in a sec. Leave a comment with your favorite polyomino. There are so many nice cats in the front yard. We might have to take a field trip there in a minute because those cats are looking awful soft. But there are a lot of cat uh, cat meows, cat cameos, a lot of cat cameos in the upcoming combo class episode. So the one coming out tonight or tomorrow, we got some good cat in it. Now. I've brought two board games, and the reason is because, okay, this sounds weird, but my family has two games that are Tetris related. Now the first one is the simpler one that has the Tetris pieces, and then almost as a joke, because it was like, seemed like a more complicated version of it, somebody got this one as a gift that is a future, another Tetris one, and this one's really complicated. This one's really simple. But this one is like everyone shares one Tetris map that you drop all the pieces into. This one, everyone has their own Tetris map or whatever you call it. So here we got a bunch of Tetris pieces of different colors. The new one might actually be better. I think they color code them different. So 
in the new one, here are the tetrominoes. And let's look at them tiling the plane for a moment. So, here we got this one. We have this shape. This shape is four squares put together in a thing. It's a polyomino. And can I tile the plane with it without gaps? Well, let's see. Yeah, I can. This is looking neat. I can tile the plane without some gaps. We gotta be careful. I'm not sure if that orientation would work or not, but when I tile the plane without gaps, even though there's a way to make it weird and like orient them differently, we have to then ask if we're looking for an aperiodic tiling, is there a way to do it where I can translate an arbitrarily large chunk of it onto itself and maintain the same? And if I do it like this and I'm kind of lining them all up so they're all the exact same orientation, they do end up fitting and I could keep going. So there is a way to tile these periodically. So say you were a recreational mathematician and you were like, let's test all of the tetrominoes. Well, that wouldn't be that hard to show that any tetromino can tile the plane without any gaps, can keep going, but in a periodic nature. There's a few ways to make this one work. I could also line them up like this. And there's ways to do it without filling in any gaps. I could do that with the other tetrominoes as well. Like if I have this L one, there's a way to make this fella be fully periodic. You know, a few different ways I could put together a pattern that would loop forever. Now, the reason I brought these out is because it shows a lot of copies of the same tile. Now, imagine if our goal is a mono tile. And we want one tile that can do it, but can only do it. There's no way I can put it together where a bunch of it would slide to be the same as the rest of it. The only way I can do it is in this increasingly weird evolving way. Well, those Penrose tilings did it, but those took two tiles. Those aren't a mono tile. You could call those almost a duo tile. Don't think that's a technical term, but it's a duo tile by my book. And... The other thing you could try is maybe we'll combine shapes that are on a grid of non-squares. Maybe we'll look at, it's, this isn't exactly what the thing is, but what the aperiodic tiling is. But let me find this. I'm trying to look at this, for example. Here's another place you could look. These ones are called polyabolos, and they, these are ways of joining equal, or no, uh, I call these fellas isosceles right triangles. Some call them a 45, 45, 90 triangle going by degrees. I understand the logic, but they are the only type of isosceles right triangle. So why not just go with that and call them the isosceles right triangle? A lot neater than having a degree-based convention. So connecting different ways of joining, like these are the level one, the monoabolos, I guess, the duabolos, the triabolos, quadrabolos, all of the ways of connecting a certain amount of this shape. Now, these aren't the only type you can make because, oh, they, they do they actually call them triabolos? Okay, cool. I randomly got the name right. So those are in, you remember that game called Tangrams? Anyone do that game? It's like a, you try and put together shapes like this. I had that as a kid and I love trying to put together the shapes into the different pieces. However, a better version of Tangrams is Pentominoes. Now, it's a polyform showing us we have many types of these. These ones, Polyimons. These ones are like uh, based on equilateral triangles. How many ways can I combine equilateral triangles? Stuff like that you might get curious about. Do any of these shapes, you know, these weird tile combo guys, like, like a polydrafter, do any of these polydrafters uh, 
as a single tile, do a only admit aperiodic tilings, can tile the plane without gaps, but only in ways that don't have a big scale copy shifted over of itself, only like weird ripples. Well, it's not exactly that, but it's not that far. This is the shape that is the a pure, the, not the newest one. So this is one level back. This was discovered, I want to say somewhere around one to four months ago. It was pretty recent. It was more than a month ago, but less than a year ago. There was a paper published that involved these things. So this is not the today's piece of news, but this is a cool shape because it's a single shape that it, along with its flip, remember how I noted that I use 12 pentominoes in a set. Well, 12 is the amount of pentominoes you have if you don't count flips as the same as each other. Some of these tetrominoes, they count differently. So in the Tetris board game, this is the other reason I brought these out. Some of them are flips of each other and fall differently. So when you're playing Tetris, you might get this piece, this one fall down this way, or you might get it fall down this way. And they're different. No matter how you rotate them, they're, they're not the same. They're only the same if you flip them but you cannot flip them in Tetris. And so you can't in the Tetris board games either. So, note, this is far from sponsored from the games. The game was pretty complicated. It was fun, but there's a lot of improvements you could make. Um, now, these tiles are flip copies, and if you allow a flip copy of this shape and itself, then it only allows aperiodic tilings. So they're like, okay, we found such an upgrade. And it was, they found a huge upgrade. This was the one from a few months ago, not this week's. Was we found a mono tile, assuming you allow it and its flip to count as the same tile. But it left a question. Now, I was even going to make an episode about this already. This was in the last stream I noted before I read that they had just, like around the time of the stream, dropped a newer one that I mentioned. I, I thought this was the type of big enough, cool geometry news that I was waiting to see like number file or someone uh, do a video explaining it. I haven't seen much big scale YouTube coverage of it. So I was like, all right, I better make a mono tile episode in June. We better go through the little history of Penrose tilings to the aperiodic mono tile here. However, a third level dropped. The question that I left in last stream was I said, you know, it's really cool they found one of these, but they haven't proven whether or not there is one that can only a periodically tile without needing to flip just a single shape that you don't need to flip. It's only because when we're doing the tilings, it's a little different than playing around with these pieces where I can flip them. Imagine if I am glued to a board and they have to be oriented the same way. Well, within the last week, it has come out that they have found it. The math, community and world has found a new shape. So wake up everyone. New tile just dropped a chiral, a periodic mono tile by chiral. This is a complicated word relating to things and their reflections, but hear what they're saying in an overview of the paper and some pictures of some things is that they have found a few different families of shape. The last one was a family. The hat aperiodic monotile is a family of ways of connecting all these little dudes, kind of reminiscent of those poly et cetera's that we were looking at earlier. But now they're like, all right, we found one that not only doesn't require the flip, 
but there's different types they've found. They have categorized a weekly chiral and a strictly chiral. Now, the weekly chiral says if you forbid reflections, so you cannot flip it, then it admits only non-periodic tilings. But if you flip it, then you can use it and its copy to be periodic. They also found one called strictly chiral that tile, their only way of tiling aperiodically is whether or not you allow flips. They have to tile aperiodically. Now, these shapes are clusters of little things made from smaller geometric shapes, kind of like these tetrominoes, but way more complicated. Now, let's look at the actual paper that they came out with. So this paper, this is a preprint of a paper that came out four days ago, but I didn't see any news coverage of it until right after last stream when I said this hadn't been discovered yet. So I guess in last stream, I was two days late on my uh, finding of the preprint of this paper. So... The recently discovered hat aperiodic monotile, which is the one that it and its flip could make this happen, admits tilings of the plane, but none that are periodic. That means that it is an aperiodic tile, as it's nicknamed sometimes, is, you know, aperiodic monotile means the only tile, it does, it can tile the plane without gaps, and it can't tile the plane in a periodic way without gaps. This polygon settles the question of whether a single shape, a closed topological disk in the plane, can tile aperiodically without any additional mashing conditions or other constraints on tile placement. The hat is asymmetric. It is not equal to its image under any other non-trivial isometry of the plane. In particular, a hat cannot be brought into perfect correspondence with its own mirror reflections. Moreover, all tilings formed by copies of the hat must use both unreflected and reflected tiles. Some people have wondered whether the hat and the reflection ought to be considered two distinct shapes, thereby invalidating its status as a monotile. To some extent, this question is about tiles as physical objects rather than mathematical abstractions. Now, since I am reading a bunch of this because I like how it's phrased, let's shout out the authors. These folks are the ones who discovered this. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. They note that they found new ways of configuring dots and mutating these configurations to find an infinite family of shapes that if you don't let it flip and you say, we just have it, there is no flipping. It can only tile the plane aperiodically. This fact dropped four days ago, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone else. Now, here we got one patch from these. It's very hard to see which parts they're actually describing. And they, they outline some lines thicker to show the aperiodic status. Some are the set tile themselves. This is relatively new to me. This is my second time reading this. So like I said, I will at some point probably do a bunch of research and make an episode about this fully explaining exactly what all this means on the combo class channel. Remember folks, this is my bonus channel. Go make sure you're on the combo class channel too. Now here we have, I don't know enough about it to give you the episodes amount of details. However, however, it's like brand new news and I, we know the gut background feeling of it. The important fact is that level one they've found here is a shape that 
if you forbid flipping, it still only tiles aperiodically. Now, level two, they went even further. So they nicknamed these things. I love it. The old fellas called a hat. These ones they call specters. So, you know, I stand by the right of mathematicians to give things fun nicknames. I think it helps. Now, you got your specters. But, and so first, they prove, here's how it looks to prove something like this. They're like, we have to be really clear. This is what it would look like if you were a specter. This is what it means to want to be a specter. And then they have to say, first thing, there exists a specter. They have to prove that one of these types of shapes can exist. So they go through the proof. I will read through this more thoroughly before I make an episode about this. Now, here they say, next theorem. It, the specter admits a tiling that you could zoom out in to make a larger type of specter, basically. They're saying that if you zoom out in a certain way, there's an infinite unique hierarchy of larger and larger super tiles. Well, I guess this isn't saying for different types of specter. I guess this is saying that since the super tiles don't match in that way, the specter is aperiodic because the super tiles do crazy stuff. Now, they do take it further. From spec See, it's a long paper. They're combining this with the other guys and the other thoughts. And where's the part they go to the other one? There's one here that I don't know where it is in the strict paper, but where's the strictly chiral? I guess I'll search for that. Okay. Strictly chiral. So, oh, the specters are the strictly chiral. We jumped all the way into that. So specters are ones that you can allow flipping or not is as far as I've understood this from my second read through this is that there's a previous, where's the previous shape they found the pre specter one that is the weekly. The 14 sided polygon is a weak. So this one, this right here is a weekly chiral one if you don't allow flipping, like I was saying. But th th that's not a specter, I guess. So, this, okay, here we go. This one isn't the specter. They have these modification techniques to turn it into specters. And these ones called the specters, they admit it even if whether or not you allow flipping. So by doing this mutation on this shape, they create this ultra family of the strictly chiral ones. So I'm going to research this more. I had to make the stream right now to be like, folks, this week, new math news dropped. In fact, I want to discuss other things that have come out in recent to recent ish math history of news. And I might, on the shorter end, wrap up this particular type of math news, but I do have other things I want to share. I'm going to leave this open just in case. We'll keep this article ready as I jump back and I'm going to take a peek at the chat for a minute. Then what I want to share is what's because this I do need to research this more before I can fully make an episode explaining like this is the shape. This is how it's doing this stuff. But there is another recent improvement on a mathematical thing that is related to the next episode coming out on the Combo Class channel. And another recent-ish episode or near future episode I'm considering relates to a not as recent, but on the big scale recent mathematical discovery. 
So let me take a peek at the chat. Then we're going to talk about those. Thank you all for joining me. You are all so awesome. To whoever asked how long it'll be, probably an hour to two hours. To somebody who wonders if we can use a computer program to test for all tilings. The thing is, you don't know what type of tiling to look for, where there probably has been a computer program to test all of the square connections between things up to some point. But the ones they created here are based on a slightly weirder, almost like it's something closer to a 30, 60, 90 triangle or 45, 45, 90 triangle though. Not exactly. I need to look into it more that they are combining into making these shapes. So it's hard to know what to look for out of like the infinite continuum of options and the original hot shape, at least maybe the new one as well. I think it was linked was discovered by a hobbyist ish mathematician who wasn't the type who was like writing research theses about the big scale thing of this field. They were investigating a particular fun thing about shapes and managed to prove something great about them. So somebody's wondering uh, whether we're bound by the rules of 2D. And that's one of the big questions between these different types of tiling. Some of them are saying flipping's the same. Some are saying flipping is different, but we have to factor in for both. And some are saying can't flip. No. Yeah, somebody, uh, George here is saying, what a time to be alive for all these discoveries. It is really cool that uh, I think throughout mathematical history at different times, there has been a bunch of discoveries, but there probably was slower times. And now through a mix of the internet helping a lot of people use each other's theorems across the world, because sometimes you have to, you know, use a lot of old theorems to build a new one. A mix of that and the fact that computers can help us with proofs and there's just more population and possibly more widespread education. There may be a faster rate of mathematical discovery right now, as opposed to many times of history. Maybe in Euler's lifetime, maybe you were getting a slightly even quicker rate due to like him churning out so many cool papers. But during, throughout most of history, we probably weren't finding things on a month to month basis like we are now that are like not only worth saying throughout the world, but able to say throughout the world. So for example, any ideas I have that I will build with my viewers and friends and such to work toward, I will have a really big head start through the internet. I don't like technological things. I don't like the actual dealing with technology, but you got to love that the internet lets us share our theorems and thoughts on such a wide level. And to whoever wonders if this relates to chaos theory, I could imagine a connection due to the fact that this is showing it must be aperiodic. So maybe there could be a measurement of to what degree is each one tilted from the last or something that could show increasing unpredictability at different times. Hard to say. Now, let's jump into another thing I wanted to share about an open one. I just want to note that the next episode coming on the combo class channel is mostly like going to take on a slow, steady arc of what it means in this open problem in mathematics, a graphic visualization of things, a analogy to describe it as people and connections and some obviously like mathematical versions of it too. So it's mostly an arc of the open question. So the new knowledge isn't going to be until near the end, but 
at some point in that episode, there is a moment where it shows the upper bound of something has been improved. There is a improvement on a general formula for a not an upper bound that'll help us solve the unsolved part of the problem, but like a really big number something can't be beyond. And although this is very shape related in ways, it can be described in algebra and the answers are numbers, even though the demonstrations will be shapes. So at some point in that episode on a title card, I'll note that one of the recent improvements on an upper bound on this question was within the past few months, at least within the past year. Sometimes it's hard to say when it dropped because sometimes they do like a preprint of the paper, like the one we just looked at, and then it doesn't get news coverage right away. So like almost no one knows about the preprint sometimes, but it's out. Hard to say. And then, you know, they discovered it before they published the preprint. So hard to say when it was discovered. But within the last year, it has been released that the upper bound has been improved again on a question directly correlated to the next combo class episode. And the big number makes me want to look at another big number that's actually related. I mentioned for like one sentence in the episode that I'm like, by the way, this thing we're looking at, a very related though not identical question, the, the thing we're looking at is ends up having a number for an answer, even though the question is what's called graph theory, ways in which points can be connected. The another upper bound, very reminiscent of the one I'm talking about that just got improved toward the quest, toward exactly the question of the episode. Another upper bound that's a really big number, but tells you something about what a certain thing can't be bigger than. And if you can prove that really big upper bound, it's useful whether or not it's too big to come into play because you're cutting down sometimes from infinity to finite, no matter how big that is. Now, an upper bound that was once known for a very similar, though not identical question to the one that we're going to ask in the episode coming out tonight or tomorrow. The upper bound was the number called Graham's number that a bunch of people have requested I talk about already. So this is one of the most popular big numbers in math. And I guess um, I'll give the clue right here that it says it's within what's called Ramsey theory which is within the thing called graph theory. And Ramsey theory is named so very similarly to something called Ramsey numbers that come into play in the episode we're looking at. Technically, the main question we're looking at in the episode is related to a thing called diagonal Ramsey numbers. And the first unknown one is the fifth diagonal Ramsey number. But don't worry, you have no idea what that means. It's a simple enough concept that I don't even use the word graph theory until very late in the episode. Uh, because I, I like to lead a little arc of what, what question they're really asking that we don't know as mathematicians. Now, here's the thing. The answer to this question will be a small number. But the amount of thing, and you could prove this small number by brute force checking a large amount of graphs, a large amount of ways in which vertices could be connected. However, there's not a computer on earth that can calculate the fifth diagonal Ramsey number. I imagine that maybe someday in the future, either humans or aliens will be able to invent a computer, maybe a planet sized computer that could calculate that one, but probably not the sixth. They get big pretty quick. How many things you'd have to check. So a similar question. Oh, squirrels. Hi. Hi. Oh, 
Oh yeah, you're so brave. You want some nuts later? Oh yeah, I told you that the younger squirrels are so brave. Okay. Got to appreciate the squirrels. Unfortunately, the screen was small, so you might not have seen it perfectly. But God loved squirrel cameos. There is a squirrel cameo in the upcoming episode on Combo Class 2, uh, as well as multiple cat cameos. Now, the number that I was talking about that's really popular called Graham's number is a type of number that is way bigger than numbers like Googleplex or whatever. However, I'm going to someday before too long make an episode about how to easily make numbers bigger than Graham's number. We can make numbers way bigger than this, fellas. Don't worry. I got a simple formula. I call it my sandwich numbers. Just wait till I tell you about my sandwich numbers. They are going to... Trust me that the uh, one type of my sandwich numbers... Sandwich... sandwich. Uh, well, there's a sandwich operation I made, too. Something like three sandwich three is way bigger than Graham's number. So, now, it is big, though. Graham's number is far bigger than any computer to fit on it. Now, it relates to ways things can be connected, but it's not the exact same question we're going to be asking in today's... Or, I might have the episode out tonight. It might take till tomorrow because... There's a lot of, part of it's there's a lot of wind that day. And so I'm kind of cutting together the best takes that I film that don't have bad wind noises. Still need to work on getting my voice extra clear without losing the bird sounds. Now, it's a really big number, but we can make way bigger numbers. Don't worry. The point is that Graham's number originally was an upper bound of they know that this question's answer can't be bigger than Graham's number. So similarly, we will see upper bounds for certain things in the episode, like the new formula that came out within the past year that improves a general upper bound for the type of number we're going to look at, as well as what is the upper bound for the unknown one, the fifth one. And in fact, I might at the end of this stream, I have to draw one more table that I want to put in the episode. I could copy someone else's table online, but I probably want to draw it on a big whiteboard and actually have my own version of the table because the one I found online didn't look quite how I would have laid it out. So... I think near the end of the stream, I might draw a table of numbers that I'm very vague about that I might leave the stream on for and just tell you, look at what this thing is as far as a mysterious number. And it's not going to be explained until the actual episode. But we might draw an interesting table later today that involves upper bounds. Now, one last thing that recent-ish discoveries relate to is... Another episode I thought I might want to do in June is we got a little anniversary coming up of an important mathematical event. The first time that one of the biggest unsolved problems in math for many, many years was something called Fermat's Last Theorem. After the fact that you can do A plus B equals C for whole numbers and that you can do a squared plus b squared equals c squared for whole numbers, which are the Pythagorean triples and the side lengths that a right triangle with integers for sides can have. It was wondered, can you do the third power or fourth power? Can I have whole number cubes add up to another? You can even see that with dice right here. Can I, can I make two cube numbers that... Here's one cube plus two cubed. One cube plus two cubed does not add up to another cube. 
Can't reassemble this to a cube. Can I add any two cubes into another cube? I can do it with squares for sure. But you can't do it with cubes for whole numbers. And Fermat conjectured it more than 300 years ago. And it wasn't proven until 20 years ago from... This was the time the paper was first presented and that it was first known that this was proven. It was corrected. There was a mild error that needed fixing. So technically, it wasn't until 1994 that it was fully finished. But the version in which was presented that was mostly complete that showed, oh my God, someone solved this more than 300 years old problem, was in 1993, almost exactly 20 years, or no, that's 30 years, Oh, it's 30 years. I guess I was saying 20 years last time for some reason. Almost exactly 30 years from a week or two from, from no, no, a few weeks from now. From It was the 21st through 23rd. I'll need to figure out which of these dates is the most important of June. 30 years ago was first presented that this 300-ish or 358 year old problem had been solved and it was proven you can't do it for any exponent higher than two so i was already thinking about making an episode about that for the 30 i was thinking 20th for some reason because we're in the 20s but for the 30th anniversary of fermat's last theorem being proven but that totally fits into our theme both of our themes of geometric things, because we can use a geometric analogy for some powers, as well as our theme of, can you prove cool stuff nowadays still? Ooh, yeah, you can. Some stuff like Fermat's last theorem takes a really long paper by a really smart mathematician who worked for many years on it. Other stuff like the hat monotile is something that, Somebody who just really likes dedicating time to a random problem and playing around with it might solve. So, fun stuff is still left open in math. And uh, George notes here, log of sandwich BLT in relation to my sandwich numbers. Funny enough, although BLT wasn't one I picked yet, I did think of different types of sandwich to name my different types of sandwich numbers after because I had different types. So I was like actually thinking about like, okay, this is the club sandwich number. This one's the grilled cheese number. This one's stuff like that <laughs> because there is different variations. Uh, but I will unveil my sandwich number. They actually show up or to a degree, they show up in some of my fictional writings that I'm going to try and start publishing before long. But they also will show up in whatever episodes more dedicated to Graham's number. Graham's number gets a quick mention in the upcoming episode, but it, there will be an episode more dedicated into the future to what is Graham's number and how can we easily make numbers that are even bigger. Now, I came up with this really complicated way to make big numbers. And if anyone knows a lot about the field called Googleology, where you uh, try and make big numbers in cool ways, uh, reach out to me because I do want to run some of these thoughts by someone and see to which degree they already have names in this funny field called Googleology. That funny in a good way that I want to know which of these things may have already been investigated or named or not, but I came up with many ideas of how to make big numbers. So, yeah. Now, somebody said, somebody explained dimensions to them with geometry. It all goes back to math. Well, dimensions are sort of inherently uh, geometric or at least inherently easy to make a geometric analogy of. Because you can imagine, oh, let's cross back. These squirrels are so cool. Okay, I I need to run inside in a minute to go to the bathroom and grab some water real quick. But 
when I do that, after um, I say one or two more things, on our next mini intermission, I'm going to grab a few nuts for those squirrels. So what worked once before was I put some nuts up on that shelf up there, shelf up on the fence, and the squirrels would run by and grab them. And one time they even knocked over a clock grabbing one, but I don't mind. They can knock over my clocks. It was funny. It uh, probably, whenever a clock falls, to anyone who doesn't care when the clock falls, they don't find it funny or whatever, engaging, remember that it does draw random people's attention and trick them into learning important things. So sometimes the chaos, you know, draws in all sorts of people who we can trick into learning about unsolved questions about math. So... Thank you to everyone who's been joining. I'm leaving really nice comments. I really, really appreciate you all. It's really, really cool how this channel is still growing and still doing wild stuff. I want everyone to remember that this is my bonus channel. And in terms of it's my less perfectionist, more free form, playground-ish channel. And so although it has a lot more subscribers because people liked all the shorts and because sometimes the quality the quantity channel has drawn more people than the quality channel that's okay you know i like having both channels i am trying to share more shorts with the main combo class channel now that we're in grade negative two and they did so shockingly well for this channel in grade negative one so i am going to be putting more shorts on the combo class channel too some of them are not going to subscription and notification feeds because I want people to be ready to like really pay attention to my long content, not the live streams necessarily. The live streams will though in the descriptions contain the new shorts and stuff linked. So I do have linked in this description, for example, five shorts that have come out on the combo class channel so far which I bet most of you have not seen at least the latest one that I said new on top of. Don't leave the stream quite yet. I'm going to go inside for an intermission in a minute. So in a minute, um, I mean, it'll help the stream if you leave this window open too. But when I go inside, watch the newest short that's linked in this description, as well as if you haven't seen the other ones on the Combo Class channel. It's so funny how biased the shorts algorithm is toward how long you've been posting on it. I posted out of the most recent shorts I did, my favorite ones on the Combo Class channel. Got a few thousand views only because they're like the first ones I've put on there in terms of the shorts algorithm. And then on the Demotro channel here, I put out the most random short ever about here's a little way to multiply a two digit number by 11 and it's past a million views. It's like, it's so biased toward how many shorts you've put on the channel so far and how it has to be liked shorts. So don't go spamming YouTube with bad shorts, but so yeah, whatever. I'm going to be posting some of the shorts on the combo class channel, even though it's going to take a while for that channel to be liked by the shorts algorithm enough to get the same amount of views on a great short there that a decent short would get here. It's not all YouTube being biased because part of it is that their machine tries to point it to new people and see if they like it. And on this channel, they have a better idea of who to point the shorts toward who will like it and make them want to keep pointing it to people on that channel. It's like if they don't know you in the shorts algorithm for the channel, they put it out to random people who are like, what, why is there math on my shorts page? So if anyone wants to help, the channel get those shorts more out there just to get more combo lords to the main combo class channel where my best episodes go uh it wouldn't hurt if some of you watched those five shorts that are on there so far once or twice and left a comment or something just saying you know it wouldn't hurt now i'm gonna run inside grab some water hit the bathroom and I want you all to either watch those shorts or chill and look out for squirrels. I will also grab them some nuts.
All right, folks, we're back. We're back. Thank you to all my combo lords who stick around during the intermissions. You know how it is to live stream for a few hours. Sometimes you need to run and hit the bathroom or take a breather for two minutes or whatever. Somebody said um, the Rayo's number video. I assume they're referring to the number file video. Number files had some cool videos about large numbers. I think I will do an even cooler job at explaining Graham's number and things like that. However, I haven't yet figured out some of the mysteries of a number that they did mention called Tree 3 that I am still intrigued in investigating more. Now, somebody says every short has the same Jack Harlow comments. It's true. Everyone thinks I look like that guy. Here's the thing. Somebody set me up to rap battle him for charity or something. I will rap battle Jack Harlow and I will beat him. You, I got, you can trust me, Combo Lords. I'm not joking. I'm not saying the guy's terrible. He's a decent rapper, but I will beat him in a rap battle. You might think I'm joking and just being like, oh, I can mathematically cook up a thing. But uh, I secretly love rapping and I will... I, <laughs> okay, some of my Patreon supporters or people who have reached out to me know, but I have online under other old names more than 10 full rap albums. So, or I guess some of them would be called mixtapes. Some of them are over, are over other people's beats. I have multiple albums and over 10 mixtapes under old names. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to release those someday, but we will do stories where we drop all of those eras. We will also be releasing new music at some point. And if anyone ever gets me hyped enough in a stream, I will wrap you one of the verses that will come out in the future. But so far, we've only done one or two beat making streams. We're easing our way there. Sometimes there will be music on this channel going forward. And as I've said to those who don't end up liking the music, you can always skip those because first of all, it won't be the majority of the content on this channel. And second of all, this is my playground channel, and if you ever get bored here, just make sure you're still tuned into combo class. Now, this was even most of what I wanted to talk about for, I have this mathematical thing I need to share with the stream. I better make a stream. It's a cool new thing we dropped. New shape just dropped. Oh, man, I forgot to get the nuts for the squirrels. Maybe I'll get them some nuts. Later. Okay, here's what we'll do. I think I got some bird seed left out here. Maybe we'll get them some bird seed. They like this stuff. Where's my bird seed at? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna give the squirrels some bird seed. Now, why is it in this bag? Because I had previously left it out in its own bag and the squirrels ripped it open. But that's okay <laughs> if the squirrels rip open the bird seed and I leave it out. So they're right. I live outdoors. I am not going to blame any wild creature for being a wild creature out here because I'm being a wild creature out here. Now, I didn't have any nuts for the squirrels. I forgot to check, but I'm going to sprinkle a little bird seed up here and I think they might enjoy it. It may attract them to stay a little longer. So here's the main goal. If the squirrels chill up here, that'd be really cool. Okay, now to make sure they understand, let's put one or two drops up here. Now, to see if they really want to come into the zone, we're going to put a little bit on the edge of the planter. And we're going to leave them a little trail going toward the desk. Here's places the squirrels might get birdseed all over. Leave them a little trail. Now, if they come all the way to the desk, yay. Someday, <laughs> I do, okay, I have these shots in the back of my head as like a combo class director that I have these images of like, I'm gonna put those in an episode someday. And I've already done some of them. Some of the things that are in my episodes were things I had envisioned years ago. And one of the things I envision is one day I will be just like how we now have squirrel cameos while I'm saying a line in the background, 
there will be a time where I am saying something mathematical to you folks and a squirrel's just on the desk eating a cool nut. I'm just going to be right next to a squirrel. It's going to be eating a nut and we're going to be hanging out while I perform some mathematical knowledge. <laughs> I have other visions in my head. You know, someday in combo class, for example, I will be in a beekeeper suit surrounded by bees. Someday, for some reason, I have in my head going to a volcano, but I almost more have in my head the idea of it being I like the idea of having a whiteboard and me in absurdist but actually going there locations. Now, of course, someone would be like, yeah, I just CGI the volcano or whatever. I'll let you know if we ever use computer effects. Maybe in a future grade there will be times where I tell you we're about to use a computer effect. But I would rather go to a real volcano. <laughs> so, you know. Maybe I like using combo class as an excuse to actually see the world and then you can see my experiences. And one day we will go on a quest for some rare type of fruit or animal to in some strange, you know, other. Well, I guess it, it's not, I don't mean strange in like a uh, mean way, but in some foreign country that I don't know as much about, we may go on quests for fruits and animals we have never encountered before. So uh, I'm looking forward to using combo class as an excuse to actually test out the possibilities of a human interacting with the world that you'll get to see in real time. And that will include, of course, all of my mathematical obsessions, but also, all the natural cool things in the world that we might be able to seek out. I think that not enough math channels embrace the nature side, and I don't even see myself as a math channel. I see myself as a overarching educational channel run by a guy who's obsessed with math. So, it's not like this is get ready for your math video every Thursday. It's like, I'm going to make a video about the things that I think are important for me to share with the world. And a lot of those are going to relate to numbers. Now, much love to all of the regular people here. By the way, if I ever read out comments and I don't shout out names, it's kind of part. There's two main reasons. One, I don't want to worry about having to pronounce them right. Two, I don't want to encourage the fact that people get their name in my stream if they leave a cool comment. I just want there to be cool comments. So I often just say, so-and-so left a comment. But sometimes I may uh, shout out our names of our extra regulars. I would love to shout out Stick right here for helping with the moderation. Magic Fellow, who may not be here right now, but often helps me with stuff. And uh, even George, who was here earlier and may be here, who has sent a bunch of cool stuff. And all of our other cool regulars. Now, somebody's wondering, what's the difference between a new shape and an organic shape turned straight? I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Uh, there's no such thing as a new shape in terms of inventing a shape out of the continuum of possible shapes. You could argue that every shape is already there and that by discovered, we mean just said something about one of the things that is there. I was thinking that as a writer, too, about how there's an infinite sea of possibilities. And by saying something, whether it's a mathematical truth you demonstrate, or by saying a hypothesis or a story or whatever, you're making a little island, almost a sand island that's prone to melting out of that, within that uh, ocean of possibilities. So I think that throughout my life, there will be different little islands I make in that ocean of possibilities, whether they're, here's a math fact that I am saying obviously was already true, but maybe hasn't been pointed out by a human yet, or something that is a story that is, you know, a new fictional world out of the continuum of possible fictional worlds that hasn't been said yet or any sort of way of interpreting that. <laughs>
We are going to get more toward our random philosophical natural portion of this dream at this sector now that I've gone through the main mathematical topics I wanted to put. But thinking of that in general, I do have a lot of philosophical thoughts I would like to share with the world in the future. I already do, and I have begun my quest of teaching on a slightly more objective than subjective level because... I can prove my capability to the world quicker through I can, you know, demonstrate things with numbers than through a subjective thing. But I do have many things that I think are more philosophical things I would like to share as our episodes and streams go on about ways to appreciate and understand the world and what's really going on around us. Not as an answer, but about some beautiful hypotheses we could make about that. Now, feel free to leave any comments, because we are getting more into our question and answer sort of the thing, and our <laughs> assorted chatting. But perhaps we can still keep all of our cool combo lords around as we hang out and learn random things with our scientific gear and our mathematical findings. Some other things that I will want to share soon that I've said are some of my writings. I think that I'm a writer at heart as well as a video maker and musician, but almost if I had, at a you know, if there was a gun to my head and I had to pick one way to describe myself, I would say that I like writing, and that translates to my liking of talking. But in general, it translates to me wanting to create things based on my writings that people can digest. A lot of those end up other forms, like song lyrics or like scripts to combo class episodes that are not exactly scripts, I guess, but uh, I write a few pages of brainstorms before I film a combo class episode. Although there are less full quotes that in there than ideas of what topics I want to hit in the discussion. But there is a few pages of notes running into each combo class episode. And I want to start publishing my writings more and I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to start, so here's the thing. I, I own comboclass.org. I haven't put anything there, so don't worry about going there. Nothing there yet. I don't think it'll link to anything. It'll say, like, just, you know, can't. It's nothing. But I, I can publish a website, not a masterful HTML one yet. If anyone wants to help me do that for free, feel free to reach out. But I do not have the budget right now to do that. I have to use the combo class budget that I have, which is really just ad revenue and Patreons. Thank you to my Patreons. Uh, but the combo class budget I have so far, I have to use toward hiring people throughout the week to help me film and maybe edit. But I can design a site myself using one of those templates like Wix or like, you know, there's those simple templates to design a website just for text or whatever. I might just start putting out some of my writings, but here's the thing. It's a little bit of a maze. There's a, a little bit of a whole web of stories that I want to tell that I like the idea of... Oh my God, this... Okay, okay hold on one second. Sorry. I'm, I'll get back to the stories in one second. There's a squirrel chilling up there and all I can see is its tail. You see that like tail just chilling down there? I don't know if you can see that. Where's the tail? It's on like the, the greener half. Let's see. Do you see a squirrel tail? There's a squirrel with this big old tail hanging down. Okay, it's in there if anyone looked really carefully. Now, what I meant about the writing is that I do want to write mathematical texts, for example, some of the math texts that I can imagine putting out in the near future are, um, well, no, there are many texts I can put out in the near future and I'll sync my goals into the one I've promised. 
the full dissection of Thrivan and Thrad numbers and how that actually relates to existence and society and the bases we should use and everything. So the full dissection of Thrivan and Thrad numbers is probably the first mathematical based text I'll put out. But there are many stories I want to tell that relate to math and relate to other things. And I might start putting them out in an almost choose your own adventure-ish format. I mentioned this briefly in an earlier stream that by choose your own adventure, I don't mean that my viewers will get to pick what plot happens. I kind of already know what plot happens, but I know that my viewers could have the ability to pick what they see next out of the possible web. Now, there are many ways I might tell this story of turning my brainstorms into full text. And so by picking what you see next, you also might pick whatever comes out next. You know, if I get distracted on a tangent, I will end up writing more in my lifetime about that tangent than about the previous idea. So I kind of want to give my viewers not only the, the option of picking which of my ideas they want to see next in a web of a whole story, but also picking which idea I am going to turn my brainstorm into a finished text, which will then divert me toward focusing on that idea more probably. So I may let you folks in into a small town that has existed in my head for many years. And it will be mathematical, but it's more of a story and a mystery. And it may not fully make sense right away, but keep track of the puzzle pieces because it'll all add up. Now, looking back at our chat, um, thank you all to everyone here. Not everyone noticed tales of the squirrel. Uh, hopefully they were partially visible. As we continue, I think those young squirrels have some good potential to become my friends because... Like I said, they're not soured to the dangers of humanity. They can see a nicer side of humanity through me. Now, um, additionally, I will begin saying some of my random mathematical ideas in these texts and in random bonus videos that are ideas I've been fiddling around with that are mathematical, that I don't know where they go because I'm not a programmer and some things are really hard to prove then I'm going to see if anyone wants to run off my ideas. I'm just going to start putting out random mathematical ideas I had with a nickname. People can do whatever they want with them. Just at some point in what you're doing with them, say either the nickname I gave them or the fact that Demotro had something to do with it or whatever. But I'm going to just start putting out my ideas for people to run with. Because there's a lot of ways I've fiddled around with numbers that could be useful for people to find something cool about. If I'm ever rich, I'm going to pull a Paul Erdish, a name that will also come up in our next episode. Because this guy had a notable quote about the type of number that we're investigating next. Uh, Paul Erdish, one of my favorite mathematicians, put bounties out on problems. If I ever have money... I know that in addition, I don't need money for myself. Like, I don't want a fancy car or whatever. I would like, okay, I would like to live outside my parents' house and have a backup indoor set. But I, I don't need a bunch of money. If I ever had a bunch of money, everything that wasn't toward, like, a direct educational charity, I would put bounties on math problems. Because there's million dollar problems, but there's not enough thousand dollar problems. We need more of those little, you know, not as talked about problems to have a thousand dollar bounty to encourage not only someone to solve it. The person who's going to solve it isn't even going to be the person who cares about the thousand dollars more than the solving. It almost is to popularize it because it's easier to you know, hand a problem through a group setting when it has a thousand dollar bounty. So maybe we'll pull a Paul Erdish someday. He put bounties on problems. He loved open questions and some of them have been solved. As far as I've read, I don't know how recent this is, but as far as somewhat recent, he even wrote checks after his death. So I wrote checks 
Okay, no, he didn't write checks after his death. He was a zombie. He wrote checks after he was dead. No, yeah, he wrote checks to be cashed after he was dead. He's dead now, but before he was dead, he wrote the checks to uh, still have a bounty so you can get like paid by a treasurer or whatever. Don't know how recent that is, uh, even after he died to solve one of those problems. Now, as I've said, you know, it's not about the money. Anyone who solves these isn't going to be in it for the money, but the bounty some somehow helps. I don't know. We're going to do an episode before long about the million dollar problem. About the million dollar problems, which don't only include the millennium problems. There are two other problems that have more than a million dollars. There is one called Beale's conjecture that's million dollars. And there is another conjecture that has a foreign bounty that is worth translated slightly over a million. So it would help people, but it's, I, I swear it's more for the, the thousand dollar ones for a smaller problem might be like motivation for like a hustler mathematician who needs to make it in the world. The million dollar ones, it's really not for someone who's trying to make a million dollars. It's for somebody who cares enough about a problem that they're worth dedicating years upon years to know they have a 1% chance of solving the problem because they care enough about the problem. Not because they want a 1% chance of making a million dollars. There's easier ways to try that. So, you know, if you're a hustler, don't even worry about it because the hustlers, I mean, a hustler in terms of like wanting to win the bounty of the million dollars. If you're a hustler, I wouldn't worry about it because the hustlers are not going to be the ones who win. The ones who win are going to be the ones who, for fun and for personal reasons, will dedicate all their free time to it. Now, there, it's still, I think, for the $1,000 ones, could be motivation for a hustler because some of those are more easier potential to solve. Some of, some of the questions you'd put a thousand dollar bounty on haven't been tried by like a million different mathematicians over the years. It something I like a hobby. I like is looking at false proofs of common things. I find it very interesting to human psychology and to math psychology of how proofs can go wrong of looking at people's supposed proofs that are less than a few pages of things like the Colatz conjecture, the twin prime uh, conjecture, the Riemann hypothesis, things like that. When there's a problem that so many mathematicians have dedicated their lifetime to over the years and somebody thinks they can prove it in four pages, typically not true. And it's fun to read those when somebody is so confident they've proven them uh, in a way, almost as like you do as like a commentary video, kind of making fun of somebody's uh, weird psychology, but also in a way seeing like the weird beauty and how like someone's simplified ego can make them sure they've come to this majestic conclusion. I don't know kind of fun. Maybe we'll do that sometime. There's a lot of things I want to look through that I don't really want to put on the main streams that save as my main YouTube videos. I was thinking as I am getting more casual with what I do as a stream here, and I really am focusing my dedicated time into my horizontal videos and sometimes my shorts. The streams are to a degree for those who want the deeper combo realm, but I was thinking I might do some not on YouTube, not because I like or use this platform, but I was thinking of streaming sometimes on the platform Twitch just because I want to have ones where I can pull up whatever video or page I want without worrying about copyright stuff in the future. I like saving every single one of my YouTube streams as a video afterwards. You can see them under the live tab as exactly what happened in the stream. To note, it does take a minute for both the HD and the chat to process. So it takes some hours for the HD and chat to be available, half a day maybe, but I save them all as videos. So 
I don't want to worry about YouTube's copyright rules in the future for what I put on streams for some things that I would have fun putting on streams. And so I want to do more of commentary-ish things and more freeform-ish things once in a while that I might try on the platform Twitch. I will warn you before I do that. It's not a platform I use, so I have to figure it out. I'm also going to, once in a while, um, have enough budget to hire Carlo, my main camera dude, to help me run these streams and or the ones I do on other sites because I don't like running the tech on the streams while I'm trying to also be the entertainer. I want to just be the entertainer and teacher. I don't want to have to be the entertainer, teacher, and tech dude. So uh, I'm going to sometimes have enough budget to hire Carlo to stay after a filming day and run the tech on a stream. And then I will be able to deliver a much better stream for you guys when I'm not worried about the tech aspects of it. Now, I might sometimes also do that on the other Twitch platform. And I, the reason I'm holding off on that is because the thing that a lot of people do is like stream over there, but then cut some highlights of it over to YouTube. And I do like the idea of not for every stream I did there, but of cutting like if I'm not streaming on YouTube, finding the best parts to put here because I'm a YouTube watcher. Like I understand people who don't want to go over there. I probably wouldn't if it was someone I was watching. I probably wouldn't go to Twitch. There's like maybe like five channels. Maybe if, you know, I'm one of your five favorite channels. Otherwise, I can relate to you not wanting to go off YouTube to some other thing. Then... I can think of maybe 10 channels that I would, you know, watch on Twitch instead of YouTube because I don't use that app. I relate. But there's uh, some stuff that I would feel more free form just doing there. And I feel like I might even just like not even worry at all about the copyright there. Do it until they ban me. I don't care. I hope YouTube doesn't get mad if I get banned on another platform. If, like, mommy or daddy YouTube's watching, I'm loyal to you folks. I won't break your rules. I love you. But I don't care if I get banned on Twitch. So we might just do it until they uh, ban us or whatever. I also, not everyone's going to like this, but I sometimes bite my tongue by not swearing or not saying thoughts that are, like, sort of, like, jokes that relate to something that you wouldn't want a kid to hear or whatever. I do, I'm i not ever going to say something that's like genuinely offensive to someone. I have pretty high standards for morals of like terms you should learn to not use that if you learn they're hurting someone, you should, you know, not use in your vocabulary ever again. So I have pretty high morals for like, I'm not going to say things that I think are hurting people, but I still bite my tongue in terms of like saying jokes that are a little put like edgy or whatever toward what a kid would hear. And I don't even think it's bad if a kid hears a mild swear word or like a joke about someone's body part or whatever. I, but some people do. And so, you know, if in a, I understand like it's an educational channel in a combo class episode, if I ever swore, I would probably put it in the description to like warn Oh, if you're a teacher, you know, this does have a swear or whatever, because that channel. But this is my playground channel, and even more so if I tried streaming somewhere else just to have my more freeform ones. There could be swearing here and there. Somebody was like, they said it was the first time they heard me swear when I said the word ass, which is technically the last three letters of my show name and hard to avoid. So, I mean, you know, we're going to... Ass is not a big swear word in my book. So, squirrel this back. I'm sorry to anyone who finds that stuff uh, offensive. I will certainly warn anyone if there's a swear word that you wouldn't want played in a classroom in a video. But I also like the idea of streaming on another platform like Twitch just so I could bite my tongue a little less. And trust me that, you know, you can document whatever I say. You can, you know, hold me whatever things I say. If I use a swear word, I find they can be useful as sentence enhancers, as I've said in the last stream. They can, you know, build on a sentence to a degree. However, there are words, of course, I wouldn't say because they would be hurtful to a group of people, if I would say, or whatever. So, 
You still got to be careful with the things you say. Now, someone says, if I do a copyright thing, that's corrupt converter here. Uh, would I get, just get a stream mute for the segment? Probably. I don't want to deal with it. I, me not being a tech guy goes off onto like me not being like a lawyer like guy. You have to be almost a lawyer to like make sure that your copyright stuff won't give you a long term strike on your channel and that you've settled it with everyone in the right way and passed off the monetization. I don't want to deal with that. I want to make videos. I don't want to think about copyright strikes. So yeah, I just, I don't really want to think about it on either of my channels. They can also get mad about just who the person is. So like if I got fully banned on one channel, they could get mad at all my channels because it's about like the person who runs it. But I mean, that's usually for people who actually do hateful or harmful stuff, which I'm not going to do. But I don't know. I just don't want to think about it. And the reason I was thinking about doing it somewhere like Twitch is just because then I'm going to wait a little while until I have, like, arranged somebody who's... If anyone wants to help me with this, feel free to reach out. Because uh, I might... You know, I don't necessarily have the budget for this right now, but if anyone wants to help me with this for credit, um, I might want to try and set it up so that I have someone working with me to cut the best parts into bonus videos for here. And on those edits, I could make sure to avoid any copyright stuff. Now, I believe in fair use of content. I like watching commentary videos. I It's... I, even one of my like almost like guilty pleasure-ish hobbies, I like commentary channels that like roast other channels' content and things like that. But I don't want to play the game of being a lawyer for my own fair use. Even if I believe that what I'm doing is fair use that is under the copyright protection, sometimes you have to battle it. Sometimes you get called out on it and you have to like battle it almost like a lawyer. I don't want to do that. So maybe someday I'll have someone on my team to do that. For now, I'm imagining if I do weird bonus streams, I'll just like edit them down more carefully with some help of some viewer or friend to put on here. The bits that are important. Now, let's see. And I, yeah, I do want to also be a place where we are extra thoughtful about what words do make sense to say, not in a sense of judging other people. I like speaking very casually. I'm sure that if you look back on my words in the future, some of these completely normal seeming things I've said in this stream in the future will probably seem outdated in a weird way. But that's why, you know, I'm not saying we should judge people directly, but... Oh, it's squirrel. I put some bird seed for you, mister. Do you like it? You want your bird seed? Okay. <laughs> but that we should... <laughs> we should be careful with the words we say. Now, I actually want to say a weird, like... This is going to seem like random pop culture to most people. This isn't going to seem like something that most people have any uh, attachment to. So this is a little different than a lot of what I would normally say, but I don't know if anyone who watches a lot of YouTube used to watch the YouTuber called iDubs who used to make this series called Content Cop, where it's sort of like when I was describing how a guilty pleasure of mine is like, it's fun to watch commentary videos that like look at another really like harmful, bad person and like deconstruct them. And this is a YouTuber who did that in a very, like, uh, aggressive, forward way. I really liked the series. It was artistically done, but there were bits in it where I was like, whoa, you shouldn't be saying that word or something. He would push the boundaries a little too far in a way that sort of normalized weird things. And so cultivated an audience that a lot of the audience thought it was normal to say certain slur words toward a group in a joke way, sort of like maybe South Park would do or something, but like 
normalizing saying it toward like another human or something. Now that guy did, he said that he was sorry for all his old stuff and he removed all of the, or he like unlisted all of them. He still has links to all of them and made an apology and said, that's not the type of audience he wants to cultivate. And while uh, a lot of people were really mad at that and like, well, oh, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. It's not a problem. I sort of respect it because I think that it stands for a willingness to change. You didn't delete the videos. They're still available. And an understanding that the things that you can do casually in the world can ripple out in a way that could be good or bad. And... Unfortunately, by unlisting those videos, we did lose some fun, like artistic things that were done in those videos in a cool way. But it did, you know, it, it was cool to see a human who I used to watch back in the day express a certain sort of guilt for certain words I would hear in those videos I liked that I felt weird about. It, that made me like, even though I like this video, I can't really like show this to a friend. I would feel guilty and weird because it's like has something a little off about it. And so I actually think that that is um, pretty commendable and cool. So I actually liked that that guy did that. He's a pretty big YouTuber who a lot of people maybe didn't watch. But if you were back in a certain era, you probably knew of the series Content Cop. And I really liked it. And I also thought that it crossed the line in wrong ways for like, I mean, it sounds cheesy to be like, it was that he was like a white guy from a healthy, normal background and it oversimplifies things. But to a degree, you know, it's like he was like had a totally, you know, stable life and was using a lot of terms that people in a less stable life or community w was affecting. <laughs> so I I'm going to shout that out and say that's OK. And whoever said you're going to go back and watch Hair Cake. Honestly, I have a huge, one of my other guilty pleasures, I think that uh, the YouTuber who they did a lot of that stuff with called Filthy Frank, I think the old videos were genius, even though they were really offensive in certain ways. I think artistically there was some genius elements about them. So that I actually used to love that type of YouTube culture, even though I felt really weird about it because it would involve like words I wouldn't say myself to my friends or stuff. But uh, I will always have a soft spot for the content cops and the filthy Franks and stuff. And I also am glad that some of those creators have grown and seen like, all right, the things that I said, you want to evolve. It's also reminiscent of big scale stories of like Mark Twain being banned in classrooms because he uses books that use the N word as he was a white author. And in that context, people actually simplified a little too much where he was actually telling a story of racism. He was not a, a racist in the way he told that story. He was painting a picture of a racist world and using the accurate words. He wasn't calling a human that. He was writing a fiction book where humans called each other that. That was painting an actual world that happened for, you know, you could say for better or for worse, for mostly worse. And so I think that those books shouldn't be banned in classrooms. I think, you know, there's a context in which an old author would use a term that's very outdated now and, you know, you'd think is weird, but that you kind of want to know the context of the previous world. At the same time, you have to evolve your current vocabulary. You shouldn't say things that are hurting people, you know, it's, and people will duck under the fact that things can be comedy or things can be sarcasm. You know, just still be careful. Don't be an asshole. You can still, like, have fun. Like, if I go on Twitch and I start letting myself swear and stuff, like, you know, I might say, like, the F word that rhymes with truck, but there's no reason I would ever say, like, the F word referring to gay people. So there are words just, you know, don't cycle into your vocabulary, or if they happen to be in there, maybe you should cycle them out. But at the same time, I do think certain swear words can be sentence enhancers, like the ones that rhyme with bit and truck and stuff like that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe once in a while I might let myself use those sentence enhancers because I do it with friends and I have to bite my tongue once in a while. 
in any case, we're a zone of uh, love here in combo class. So any word that tries to like invalidate any community that is a human will not be accepted because, you know, just to be very clear, I don't care what race you are. I don't care what gender you are. You're very welcome. Anyone who tries to hate on that, gone. So uh, any swear words will absolutely not be hating on something like race or gender. Now, that's a little side story. In any case, the part of the channel that's love, some people might find boring because we are also a part of a channel that's about learning facts about the world and such, but it all is together and you have to be careful about how it all combines. Now, there will be more philosophy leaking out in future episodes. And one little uh, thing let's note right now you never know if any aliens could be watching this on a telescope in the future. The reason I say in the future is because it takes a while for light to transmit. So if an alien's seeing this little glimpse of light somehow, it, they're seeing it in the future because it takes a while to, for the light to get there. Uh, but if there's an alien there, what's up? Thanks for watching. A weird philosophy I have is that it's kind of fun to half pretend, half believe that there could be an alien watching you as if you are in some strange sitcom or nature show. And maybe it should put you on good behavior. Whether or not you believe there's a God out there, maybe you should be on good behavior for any of those aliens with the telescopes. And by good behavior, I don't mean like what society thinks you should do. I mean like, what do you think an alien would want to see you doing that you would feel proud of? You know, there are probably parts of your life that you would be ashamed to be on the alien show. There's probably other parts of your life that you'd be very happy for the alien show to see and witness. So why don't you try and make your life, as I do, more so what you would like to be on the weird alien sitcom nature show. You know, sometimes it's fun to half believe something if it has a good uh, emotional effect. Now, <laughs> thank you to everybody commenting with various things. That was a quite uh, different rant. As somebody noted about capitalism doesn't care about us. Um... I do think it's true that another thing I'll note while we're on the like uh, weird philosophical-ish beliefs, this is going to merge toward a little political, but it really shouldn't be. It's overly politicized that I think that capitalism is dangerous and is over rampant in our culture. I don't think we should delete it, but I think that capitalism destroys a lot of things in the world right now and is a problem. So, unfortunately, the flip of that, that some people think is like an implication of evil, but can actually imply, uh, you know, something as an alternative to some of those communist things is the dreaded word socialism, which is not something that's an on or off switch like communism, but is something that maybe we should be a little more okay with the same that maybe we should be a little more skeptical of communism. So sorry if that's a little political, it shouldn't be. What it really means is that at the heart of it, the way society is run gives corporations and money too much power and doesn't give a true democratic sense. So, um, and by democratic, I don't mean like being a Democrat. I mean like that everybody has a say, like a democracy. So obviously through my beliefs, if people, if, well, as it comes out, I am obviously closer. If somebody had to binaryify it, I would be closer on the end of something called left than something on the end called right. But things are not a binary like that. Just be a good human and think about how we don't want money and corporations to run ourselves.
So, sorry for all of those random tangents. Like I said, we are, you know, doing a little bonus ladder half of the stream as we chat now that we have already shared the reason that I started the stream, our cool tiling things. I really am somewhat procrastinating getting back to editing the audio on that episode that's going to come out on the combo class channel. I'm going to say, you know, I wanted it out today, but it'll be out either today or tomorrow because if I was on someone else's deadline, I could put out a version of it right now, but I feel like it was a windy day and I'm trying to get the audio a little better. And then I need to tidy up some title cards on it that kind of clarify make sure the math is clear when I'm giving casual explanations of stuff. So by title cards, I mean like the little pop-ups that come up at the bottom of the screen sometimes with some text. I do want to try and get some way of implicating like which title cards are the ones you really should read that are important and which ones are the ones like read this only if you want the extra math behind it. So it's kind of hard to imply which are which. Maybe I'll find a way to, I mean, in a dream world, as I have a bigger team, we're not going to need digital title cards of that sort. We're going to write it on a whiteboard and we'll have a little home written whiteboard pop up in the corner. But, uh, you know, I can only do so many cool things when I'm, 95% of what's running the show and 5% is, you know, some friends and what my budget can hire. So thank you to everybody joining and commenting on various things. Leave a comment. Also, let's do a little um, vote right here since we have a few people around and for anybody in the future. During June, there will be a few random streams that we'll do. Last time we did a vote, people voted for they wanted to hear a music-based stream of me making a beat, and I did it. So I will follow up on whatever people vote for the most. Um, I will give a few options, and let's write them down. Um, Here we go. Let's write, oh, I still got Graham's number there. We're gonna write down a few options you can vote for. You're, we're gonna put uh, letters in parentheses to stand for things. Let's, let's do five options. I can come up with five good ones. These are gonna be five things you can vote for for what you would like to see in a live stream during June. Because I'm not gonna do the every Monday thing during this month. I really like the idea of having like a fixed time every week where people can tune in, but that's going to be a lot easier once I have a few people helping me with tech here and I got a little team and I have people here to bounce my humor off. It's like, it's going to be easier to do a live stream when I have someone like Carlo running the tech. Also just cause it's like funnier to hear two people interact than one. But for now, during June, I'm not going to promise a given day of the week. What I am going to try and do is some of the live streams that I have a given topic on, I'll try and schedule a day or maybe even two days in advance sometimes so that if you see my channel, you, you know, if you click on my channel page or whatever, you'll see upcoming live stream in one day or whatever. Now, these are things that I imagine I am ready to do and could be fun to do on live streams in the future. The first one is going to be another beat making slash other types of music stream. So that would be creating a beat from scratch and or you could uh, trick me into doing some rap verses and or trick me into doing some music theory. Uh, option B is going to be an artistic stream such as clock painting or something like that. Perhaps we will paint a new clock onto this was one example of a surface I wanted to paint a clock on. Uh, and we will maybe paint a clock onto something with not the normal 1 through 12. We're at least going to switch the 12 for a 0, if not any other alterations. Option C is going to be more Desmos and or GeoGebra graphs. We can compare these two apps and uh, see which ones we can make more cool, wacky shapes on. 
Option D is going to be rare stories, photos, or videos from my past. And we will say option E is going to be something natural, such as trying to seek out cats, trying to seek out other types of animals, or taking a field trip. So I would like anyone here or in the future, leave a comment in parentheses, one of these letters, if you want to see one of these streams in June, because I already have more than enough main episodes planned for June for the main Combo Class channel. Also got a lot of shorts planned for both channels. And we'll see what bonus videos come on this channel. But these are options for streams that we could see in June. So if anyone has any preference, they can uh, leave any option. This is tiny, so I'm going to grow it a little bit. And... We'll also factor in future votes, so if anybody in the future wants to uh, leave one of these, they can feel free. Somebody left an F, and if you want to leave an alternate F, you can. You gotta say what it is, though. So if you say F and then say an idea, maybe I'll do it. But just F, kind of vague. Um, so... These are our options. Uh, leave a thought. There are plenty of other things we will get up to over these streams, but these are some of our classics that I can certainly envision doing here. So we got a lot of votes for A so far. Maybe that was just because A was the first one I typed. The votes started coming in. People want beat making and other types of music. So that's good because I want to do that more. You see... I was a private music teacher as recently as three months ago. Now, someone says, does D include listening to a recorded song? Everyone wants music. So uh, does D, uh, it could, yeah, D could maybe, D is going to include all sorts of stuff. I don't know. Um, <laughs> now, there's for the music that's good because I, I was a music teacher pretty recently. And so I didn't want, I didn't have the energy to redo all of my, uh, so the music lectures I would give for students were similar to how I would present a combo class lecture, but they were a little tampered because there's a societal expectation for what, you know, you you sign up your 10 year old kid to learn piano. There's societal expectations for what you're supposed to teach. So there were limits to how similar my lessons for the students could be to the lessons that I would give here. They were still very similar, but it still was limiting. I didn't want to play under those weird structures where it's like, I didn't know what each parent expected. Does this parent think you're going to know sight reading really well? Does this parent think you're going to know scales really well? Does this parent think you're going to know how to write a song? So I was like, come on, let's find a way to just teach things in the way I want to teach things. And uh, I think I got a good thing going. It's working so far. And now that I've had a little gap from the music teaching, I'm starting to miss it and be like, let's work in some music stuff. And the whole time I've been writing song lyrics and I've been writing beats and I've been writing other forms of music as well as writing down ways in which the other math things I've been teaching will return when we learn music theory. Like, you guys remember this shape ever coming up? I don't know if I'm doing it perfect. It's something like that. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Close. It's almost that thing. Um, something like that is going to come back up because it is uh, part of the explanation I have for why the 12-tone scale works with this magical pattern called the circle of fifths. Now... It's a very mathematical thing the music will teach. Apart from some of it is real worldy. Like if I teach you piano or guitar theory, that's going to be a little real worldy too. It's like, nah, you got to pluck the thing this way, not that way. Some of that will be bonus stuff on this channel. 
Some of it will be full lessons on the main combo class channel. I also still have a great relationship with the boss I had back in the day where like I used to work for a music shop as there's many evolutions. I went from, I worked for a music shop helping run retail for this tiny shop. I developed more and more of a trust with the owner and I was sort of a co-manager of an expanding shop that was getting a second location. I then transitioned to teaching for the shop and I was a music teacher for the shop. Then I switched out of the shop partially because I was getting crazy surgeries throughout 2022 and crazy year. And I kept some of the students, left some of the students in an amicable, amicable agreement with the boss and I taught students on my own. Then I switched out and went straight to combo class very recently. I quit with my private, with my last private music students at the end of March. Or no, was it the end of February? It was around that time, around March was the last ones. Now, and I miss them. Uh, someday I'll reach out to some of my families out of those that I actually developed a good friendship with. But I did need the time to be, you know, spent on combo class. Now we can work in more types of music theory into here as well, because I have the knowledge and I don't have any burnt outness from it being my day job. La uh, up until March, I had a little bit of like, I'm already doing this as my day job. I'm not going to also do this in my show that I love in my free time. Now my show is becoming my day job and we can incorporate my music knowledge. So Sam Reeves here is comparing the unit circle and the circle of fifths. Yeah, the circle of fifths could be compared to the unit circle. We're mostly going to compare it to modular arithmetic. So, you know, modular arithmetic, mod 12, we talk about if I'm on a clock, we got certain patterns. Well, we're going to look back at mod 12. It's funny enough, the two main uh, mods that we look at for music theory are the two that also show up in society, 12 and 7. It's, it's so super random, but I use those as analogies a lot because clocks and weekdays, 12 and 7 for cycles. And 12 is the amount of total half steps in an octave, and 7 is the amount of different notes in a major or minor scale. And so those are going to come up a lot. We're even going to be able to make analogies with clocks and weekdays. So believe it or not, what like out of all the things that would prep you for my music theory, believe it or not, the best thing to rewatch or to make sure you've seen is an episode on the combo class channel that seems to have nothing to do with music theory. An episode called modular multiplication magic solely because I talk about clock analogies and weekday analogies, and it gives you a sense for mod 12 and mod seven. And those happen to return in the 12 tone music scale that is used throughout any song you probably know, unless you know songs that are like using other semitones, such as certain Indian music and other cultures, all of Western in quotes music uses this 12 tone scale. So, ooh, speaking of clocks, did I get the delivery yet? I don't think so, but I'm gonna, I haven't been to the place in a few weeks. So the place where I have a private mailbox where people can send clocks and other stuff, I usually get a text from the place when I get a package. But sometimes the package either fits in this other box or whatever, and they don't text me. So I also try and go there every week or two. It's been a week or two though. I'm going to go there sometime during the rest of this week, sometime in the next one to four days. And we are going to see, they might text me when it's there. If not, hopefully I got them right after it comes. Sounds cool. If anyone wants to send me any clocks they want to see back here, you can always hit up my private mailbox. 
Uh, some really cool things we've gotten are from uh, George Carosi, who I mentioned, sent like this cool. I, I'm pretty sure he sent this. Someone sent the quicksand painting and a lot of other cool things that are around on the other side of me right here. So they're all like on the opposite side of the camera, but a lot of cool science stuff. So uh, you could also send weird dice, old calculators, things like that. Uh, anyone, you know, you got that old TI-84 that you had to buy for 60 bucks in middle school and then you never used again? Send it this way. <laughs> Unless you're going to find it useful. You might want to actually keep that so you can keep up with my videos. I don't know. I don't know. If you need an online calculator, go to Wolfram Alpha. That's a really good online calculator. So... Clocks will be part of the music stream. Oh, but part of why I said the thing about that old job I had is that I used to work at music shops. Uh, now the boss, I helped her grow the shop up to two locations. Now they got two shops and they're full of instruments. And I'm going to uh, book a time with them to like hang out after the shop after hours. Uh, find one of the employees who I know who's down to stay an hour after or whatever. And... You know, obviously with the boss's permission, she'll be down. But, and I I will give more thorough shout outs once I confirm if she wants this or not to her in the shop. But I, I will find a time to go after hours so we can film some of the music video episodes, the main combo class ones, especially on like in front of a bunch of instruments, like with just like a wall of keyboards and guitars and pianos. So we're just going to be surrounded by instruments for some of those. That'll be so fun. That might not be June, but I'll try and make that happen uh, like July or something. June, we I, I already have so many other episodes that I mentioned earlier in this stream we got to do. So... The June episodes, while I'm still editing all the combo class ones myself the main combo class episodes might be more like a week and a half apart from each other. We'll see depending on the episode, but I like to get them right. And I have been dropping one every like week ish, but I'm not always going to be able to maintain that pace for the ones I edit. So I am going to incorporate more editors to keep up that pace during June. Uh, and don't worry, if I ever have any editors, I will oversee the directing and make sure they keep it comboified. But as I am doing all the directing in June, probably, I'm foreseeing three to maybe four main episodes in June. And who knows what for the live streams and bonus videos, because I have some really cool topics planned, but I don't want to promise any per, uh, specific dates because, uh, you know, they'll be out when they're perfected, which, as you know, I put out a lot of content, so it won't be long before all this stuff comes out. Somebody says, does a clock with my face as the face interest me? Uh, sure, uh, it sounds... Uh, a little weird to have a second one of me in the background, but weird in maybe a funny way. So I'm down, you know, send, send a clock with whatever you want on the face. So what I would really like, though, if you can uh, customize the clock, let's put Dandelion and Sage. Let's put my cats. But OK, I, I'm cool with me as well. All right. Now. La, someone says base 12 over base 10. Okay, hold up. Base, base 12 over base 10. But let's add something to that. That's not incorrect in any way. Base 12 over base 10. By over, we mean functional for humans to use. We don't mean the number is bigger. We mean best at functionality for humans to use. Uh, let's add something to that chain. Base 6 over base 12 over base 10. So, I will make it. I know, I haven't made a single episode about it. If you've seen all the combo class episodes, you've seen multiple reasons why 6 is useful. But I haven't made an episode just about why base 6 is so good. 
everyone said that uh, I should try and collaborate with the YouTuber Jan Misali because he's into base six. He's probably like the only YouTuber bigger than me who's rapping base six. And, uh, or he or they, I'm not sure. Um, but they uh, commented on one of my old videos before I knew their channel. I didn't notice the comment like five months ago. They'll have to comment on one of my videos. So maybe I should reach out to them. Now, base 30 would be good for a species that is really good at keeping track of a lot of symbols in their head. Humans are not that good at keeping track of 30 different symbols and all those interactions. Uh, better for less symbols for humans. Base 30 is too many numbers in the base. It's not the number of the base. Very divisible. If you are going to have a base between 20 and 40, you probably want base 30. But it, it's probably too many symbols. Clocks melted together could be a combo clock, the Magic Fellow notes. Definitely could be. That'd be cool. We should melt a lot of clocks together. Uh, welcome to the Magic Fellow, who I did mention earlier as one of our other extreme combo lords who helps out on the fun Discord server, who everyone should make sure that they know about whether or not you use that app. I never did before I wanted to become uh, helpful on the combo class one when I can. And... To anybody who has uh, talked to me on the Discord or my email, I'm sorry I'm slow at getting back to you. I will respond to a bunch of more people. I'm happy when people reach out to me. It just, I, I have a lot of stuff I'm working on, so it takes me a while to get back to people, but don't uh, hesitate to re-message me if you ever want to be like, hey, reminder, I sent you this thing or whatever, because... Uh, while I will try and get back to everybody soon who has sent me cool stuff or, you know, various things, uh, feel free to bother me because I am not always going to remember to do my digital communications in between my love for, like, filming and stuff like that. So, somebody mentioned Dali, Salvador Dali. I actually, it is funny. Salvador Dali is one of my favorite painters. It's not necessarily related to my love for fire and clocks, but the reason I do like melted clocks uh, as a combo would have to get a plus from Salvador Dali's paintings. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, um, I will pull these up on Google, a few of Salvador Dali's paintings. They are pretty cool. He is one of my favorite painters. So... Here we got, like, the melted clocks everyone's talking about. These are bad uh, imagery. Or, I mean, bad amount of pixels. What do you call it? Bad quality of visual because I just zoomed in on them digitally, not clicking on them. They look a lot more fine detail than this, basically. These are, like, blurry versions of them. But so they, you got your melted clocks and stuff. You also got things that represent two states at once, depending how you look at them. Like the negative space is one thing. I have one of these on my wall indoors. I wish if we were in my room, I could show you. Where's the one I have on my wall? I mean, obviously I do not have the original Salvador Dali painting on my wall. I have a <laughs> printout of it. Um, I don't know where the original is, but some of them, the negative space shows one picture and the positive space shows another picture. Other of them, a lot of small things in the environment add up to looking like a face or something. This says tribute. It's not him, but this is like his style. Um, where in the environment adds up to a thing. So a lot of these might be tributes. I don't know. Some of these are for sure him, like this classic one, the melted clocks and ants and a clock and stuff. But yeah. That's a combo classy style. It's true. We will do a Salv Salvador Dali in real life. Well, okay. We have done a Salvador Dali in real life. We have melted clocks. But. <laughs> so. Now, somebody notes base 30 does have a good application of having seconds, thirds, and fifths. Or halves, thirds, and fifths. Do we need the fifths, though? We're so used to fifths being a thing because of base 10. 
But if we had a society that was only good at doing halves and thirds and not fifths, would it be a big problem? I mean, neither of these systems do sevenths. We consider some numbers beyond the range of comfortable to the base. I mean, they can express it, but not in a term terminating finite simple way. So, do we need fifths? Are fit like we're we're leaving sevenths behind? So, can we leave fifths behind? Well, maybe leaving fifths behind. And having a smaller base could help. Now, what about this? What about if we could sneak fifths into a different pattern? What about instead of we're looking at what are the factors of the base? Those are the best of what the base can deal with. Like base six can do twos and threes. Twelve can do twos, threes, and fours. Those are just like the best that they're at. Thirty can do twos, threes, fives. But what if we look at the trait of how nine is easy to map multiples of, and even ninths are well behaved to a degree for an infinite decimal. They're pretty well behaved. Because nine is one less than 10, 11 also has good patterns by being one more than the base. So you don't only get patterns from the factors of the base, you get some other patterns from the factors of what's one under the base number and what's one more than the base number. Now in base 12, not as good. Base 12, you're like, okay, my 11s and 13s are easier. Fifths and sevenths are still not good. In base six, five is one under the base. Seven is one more than the base. It actually is shockingly decent at doing fifths and sevenths. Base six is the best. I will prove it to you guys in the future. It, I already know. Anyone who thinks that uh, I'm keeping it light right now. If I really went flames on these other bases, they are lame compared to base six. They're weak. They're base 12 and 30 in the dust compared to base six. I will show why in the future. Of course, when I say they're in the dust, if they're in the dust, base 10 is like 50 miles away in some hole somewhere because they are better than base. Well, base 30 versus base 10 is debatable because a lot of symbols in base 30. It's like, I know it sounds nice, but do you really want 30 symbols? Do you really want for the amount of symbols we have zero through nine to triple that? I don't know. So, um, those are base 30 versus base 10 would be debatable. Base 12, definitely better than base 10. I will prove that base six is even better. Now, have I touched on fractal bases? I don't know what you mean by fractal bases. You, uh, that I don't know if that mean makes sense as a single term. Um, do you mean irrational bases, like no, bases based on irrational numbers? Um, or do you just mean fractals without the bases? If you mean fractal dimensions, that is a thing. And no, I have not touched on that deeply yet. Fractal dimensions will come up. Uh, for example, the first one that will come up with fractal dimensions is a shape called Sierpinski's Triangle. Here is the Sierpinski triangle being iterated as a fractal. This will be important in an episode before long. This also can be said to have a fractal dimension. So, we will cover that. Fractal bases, I don't know what you mean. If you, oh, if, but if you do mean irrational bases, I have. I made a whole episode about those. I did make a whole episode about irrational bases. So, fractal or factorial bases, if you meant that, that is another thing that, no, I have not done that yet. We will someday do factorial bases. Oh, the Koch curve. Yes, that one is also good. The Koch triangle. Um, this is the other one that, or what's it called? Do they call it the Koch curve? It looks triangle-esque. 
Yeah, Coke Snowflake. This one is another iterated process that we'll look at. Uh, guess what? They're both super thrieven related because triangles are the simplest regular polygon to do these fractal things to. You get multiples of three and powers of three inside them. Threevens. So these will not only show up in other episodes about fractals, but this shape and the Sierpinski triangle are going to show up in the Threevens book. Now, here's the coolest thing, though. Sierpinski's triangle shows up in Pascal's triangle if you interpret it in the right way modularly. This is a classic number theory triangle. If you interpret this modularly correctly, you can get this. That's going to be an episode. But the thing is, not only can you get this from Pascal's triangle, you, I found this in one of my own numerical explorations. There's something that I came up with one day that I've tried with a few programmers that it's a way of iterating sequences and there's a way of cut. You could color them. And when I iterate the sequences, if I start with the right starting numbers, I get this. So this showed up in one of my own experiments. So that's going to be one of my favorite episodes that, okay, when you see an episode that's about something called the pond forest sequence, about these, about ponds and forests in my sequence, it's going to be like a half hour episode. Make sure you see it. This uh, will also show up because Pascal's triangle that I said we can derive that from relates to triangular numbers. And triangular numbers are going to be a recurring theme in grade negative two. So, love you all for joining. The, I don't, I'm kind of, okay, I'm kind of procrastinating getting back to my editing. So I really like hanging out on the live stream right now. There are other interesting topics we could jump into, and we could also fiddle around with random shapes and things like that. And let me think for one moment. Let's take a meditative breather while we think about how shall the stream continue or when I shall get back to my editing. Now, leave a comment if you have a request for any of those letters to, for me to do right now, today or whatever. If you want me to do any of those letters I showed before, where's the letters? If anyone wants to see any of these things today, it's an option. So let's take a little breather and think. And to whoever who asked, isn't there something that's higher than infinity? Um, there's not something that is higher in that sensing, not, not really, but there are, there is something higher than what is known as the countable infinity. There are different tiers of infinity, one of which gets the nickname countable infinity. And there are bigger infinities. They are still called infinities, but they're bigger than the first infinity. The easiest way that it's defined or to think of it is how many natural numbers are there? Natural numbers, meaning whether you start from zero or one, it's going to work. Um, how many whole numbers, essentially positive, are there? That is... It, you, it also is the same infinity as how many square numbers there are. It's even the same infinity as how many fractions there are. But the easiest definition of it is how many natural numbers there are happens to line up with other infinities. However, there are bigger infinities. We will do an episode about that. I've been brainstorming how I can do a unique take on it. It is a classic thing called Cantor's diagonalization argument. So it's worth an episode for me to explain 
this is how Cantor's diagonalization argument shows us that there are more whole number or there are more real numbers than there are fractions, but other things that show that there are not more fractions than whole numbers. That's its own episode, but I like waiting till I have my own unique presentation on something and my own combo that I think's new or whatever. And so I have been brainstorming it. I want to merge it with an episode about ways of enumerating fractions because I want to start from a simpler question. How do we know that there's not a bigger infinity of fractions than whole numbers? Before we say that there is a bigger infinity of all the real numbers, how do we know that the fractions actually are the same infinity as the lower one, the countable one? So th that's kind of a two-parter episode we'll have before too long. Um, why the fractions are the same infinity as the whole numbers, and then why the real numbers are a different infinity. Thank you all to the nice comments, and we have requests for either art, um, cats, or stories. I think the cats are the best possible bet. Now, there's another thing I kind of want to show you in my front yard, which is there's this big potter that was put out a while ago, years ago, that has compost in it. And the compost comes from a worm bin or whatever you call it, a compost bin that has maybe worm bin has a more technical meaning too, but I mean like a bin with a bunch of worms like living in there. And you got your isopods too, your little roly poly things, and they eat all of the old compost that we dump in there. They turn it into really good soil. So we put that soil into random planters. One of them, the planter just had what we planted in it, my family a while ago, was an onion. And the onion made these giant Dr. Seuss-like sprouts. Now, here we can see that a potato does the same thing. There's a potato. And we can also see garlics did something. Okay, the garlics did not thrive. Those died. But the potato is thriving. Look at this potato plant. Now, the onion plant out front. It, whoa, 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 did I slide this really weird? What's happening? There, okay, there is the potato plant. This is why we need Carlo running the streams, folks. Yep. Um, now, although, okay, Carlo doesn't necessarily know more about the streaming technology. It might sometimes be two people bumbling around figuring it out, but it'll probably be funnier. But <laughs> in any case... Um, that's a potato plant. There's a big onion plant that was put in compost. However, it wasn't just the onion that grew because the compost likes to make little travelers. So as you can see, this was compost. And sometimes you get a little extra plant just like pop up in the corner. Little extra fella. And sometimes the extra fellas are really cool. It's surprising which plants can survive and grow a new version of themselves just by having their seed in the compost. It gets eaten by the worm or the isopod, gets, sorry folks, it gets shit out by the worm or isopod, and then it's maintained, you take the compost, you put it in a bin, and it sprouts. It, some plants just like rego. These are the plants that have regone in that single planter with the onion. Mint popped up. Um, this flower called nasturtiums that have edible petals, not the guava petals, a different one. And a fun fact, one of my first words was nasturtium because they grew also in my childhood house, not here. My family lived somewhere else, I'll tell you about another time, until I was like nine or maybe ten. And we had these nasturtiums, and I liked playing around in the yard and looking at the weird plants. I loved looking at like, oh, what's that? And one of them was called nasturtiums, and that was the one where you could eat the petals of the flower, and I thought that was cool. And so one of my first words, nasturtium. But... The nasturtiums grew there. 
if I'm pronouncing that right, even maybe I just have the habit from being a kid. I don't know. Then the coolest one there is right now in that planner, not planted intentionally, just as a traveler plant, strawberries, strawberries just grew. That's so cool. Now, remember, though, strawberries are not botanically berries. They're an accessory. Is it an accessory aggregate fruit? Or no, that's like the raspberry. Strawberry is an accessory fruit of some sort. What is it? It is an aggregate accessory fruit. It is. Strawberries are aggregate accessory fruits. They're not botanically berries. However... Um, the, they're really good tasting. Strawberries are one of my top 10 fruits, probably. They're really good. So we're going to maybe get to eat a strawberry if we go out to the front yard. Now, somebody asked if I've tested my IQ. And no, I don't believe IQ tests measure intelligence, but if anyone pays for it, I will do an official IQ test. They cost a lot of money. Let me look it up. How much does IQ test cost? Like, how much is a real one? Uh, In-person assessments can cost between $300 and $1,000. Those are the actual legit ones. If anyone wants to pay for me to take an in-person IQ test, I'll do it. You guys get all the results. But I'm not paying $300 to $1,000, and I don't trust the online ones. So... IQ, though, does not measure intelligence. It measures a really specific type of pattern recognition. Look at my episode about tests on the Combo Class channel where I made my own test. I showed some pictures of IQ tests. They're all the same type of question. These are eight shapes. What's next? These are eight shapes. What's next? These are eight shapes. What's next? It's one type of pattern recognition. Now, somebody said, can I release more music, please? I don't know what of my music you've heard other than maybe the beat making streams I did on here once or twice. Um, I will release more music at some point, And I will also send folks links to my older music. Uh, maybe you are a Patreon subscriber because those people have seen some of the old music. I linked a little more to some of the tiers of Patreon subscribers, but I will release more of my past music in the present. Not everyone's going to like it. It's aggressive. It has swear words and stuff. It's not like mean to any group of people. Like I said, I'm still a good person, but it's, you know, it is pretty hyped up aggressive rap music at times. And my, I will release my new music at some point before long too. Yes. If you get me in the right mood ever, I will even perform some of them for you. Now, the banana is a berry. A lot of rare things are berries. I have an episode about that, too. I know there's a common theme for me to be like, no, watch my whole episode about this. I talked about this. But there is my Halloween special on the Combo Class channel. is all about berries. Why would I do that for my Halloween special? Hmm. Maybe because pumpkins are berries. So... Uh, I, I've always wanted to make an episode about a berry conspiracy about which ones are berries or not. And then when I realized like, oh, pumpkins are among the group, I'm like, let's merge that with a Halloween special. Same with tomato. Yes, tomatoes are berries. We still will have an episode about the distinction between fruit versus vegetable. We haven't gone into the fruit versus vegetable categorization wars that's an episode that we will have at some point. But actually, <clears throat> the next uh, snack break is either going... There's two things that I've been wanting to do for a snack break episode on the main Convo Class channel for a while. And one of them that'll probably be the first which I might feature some of my friends in because it's going to involve eating large quantities of fruit. And I do want to involve some of my friends in the streams and videos more at times. It's going to be the edible peel conspiracy. Which fruit peels you didn't think were edible, but you can just eat. So that's probably going to be the next snack break. Now, people want to see the cats. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out 
I'm going to see how the cats are looking. I'm going to see if it's a zone where if I bring the camera out there to look at the strawberry I was talking about, that it won't be like messing with the neighbors and stuff. Remember that my front yard, my family doesn't fully own. We share it with other people. So the big, nice front yard with all the cool fruit trees and stuff. Lovely, awesome, mostly my family's in terms of we share it with people, but we get to be in it, but it is shared. So uh, remember that if we ever go out there, I have to like check first to like be like, okay, I'm not like disturbing too much stuff right now by going out there and ranting about math for 10 minutes or whatever. Now, let me check that. We got a request for the cats. The cats have been in a really nice mood recently. Prequel to know is that the cats we may meet are Dandelion, who's very fluffy, Sage, who is very silky and royal, and Sassafras, who looks like the silky little Sage, but is missing some hair because he was a feral cat until just a year ago. So, somebody says the argument's pointless anyway because fruits can be vegetables. That's part of the episode, don't worry. Maybe we're going to say that tomato is both fruit and vegetable. Maybe some things are one. Maybe some things are the other. Maybe some things are both. And maybe some things are neither. That doesn't end the debate. So somebody says they're watching this while using a metal lathe. I think you call it. It's one of those like big tools. Uh, be careful. <laughs> so I won't try and do anything that like jolts you, like jump scares you or anything. Now... Somebody says we need a bass diss track. Where I, a, a bass 10 diss track. Okay, here's the thing. My music I release is not like a math lesson. That would be cheesy. I'm not going to release songs that are a math lesson in music form. However, they have elements of mathematical references. I will diss people in ways that are mathematical and re reference mathematical phenomena. I don't think I'll make a whole episode about a thing like, I mean, a whole song about a thing like Base 10. For some reason, that seems cheesy to me. I don't know. My music, will def it has a lot of math references, but it's not like to learn math. It's, you know, to sound good and cool and to be interesting. Now, Whoever said rap is so 2017, I hope you're joking, but hip hop is a very expansive genre that has a lot of cool stuff. And like any genre, some boring stuff. Now, it's not the only genre I like. I also very much like rock music. I like funk music. I like classical music. The music I'm currently making would probably be called hip hop, but it has influences of many things. It's, you know, not... It's not like a different hip-hop artist you've already heard. So, thank you all for the comments. What we're going to do... Uh, oh, and his hot dog a sandwich. Okay, I guess I should show this thing that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so, not that I fully agree with this. I'm not saying I fully agree with this. But this is a pretty logical start to how to identify things. I'm not saying I agree with this, but this is somebody's, uh, I, how we could do it. So you got, I don't know why toast and sandwich are the same. Oh, the sandwich has one up there. It's just very light colored sandwich, taco, sushi. It's hard to see which ones are colored, I guess, in this, but you could categorize based on walls like that. That was just the thing I saw the other day. So shout out. It's called, this one is on cubrule.com. I have a whole website for this. But I don't know. Is a hot dog a sandwich? It's a good question. There's a whole podcast called that I listened to once or twice. Now, there's, um, let's see what I say. I say, no, I don't think so. I think that it's a very blurry gray scale, but I think that sandwiches 
I think if you separated the back of the hot dog and you had a good amount of toppings, then it would be a sandwich. If you had a good, okay, if you had a really big hot dog that was, had a bunch of toppings on the side within it, tucked between it and the bread, then maybe you could call that like a sub sandwich. Now, hot dog is more of a taco. Yeah, yeah, that's correct what someone noted here. Somebody asked, can I make a video about why some people consider Y and W and J? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I made some episodes back in the day, or by back in the day, I mean like eight months ago, on the Combo Class channel. Uh, there was a two episodes that are about language. I will return to it. I have episodes planned about pluralization. We're going to do one about how crazy pluralization is. And we're going to do some about words that have no rhymes. And we're going to do, uh, there's a few language ones I have planned, but there is two I already did about letters where I say that X, kick it out, useless. Q, kick it out, useless. C, kick it out, useless. How we put H after things to go ch and sh, wrong, redistribute the H's. So I did make some episodes about that. Uh, it's, and to be honest, it is half outside my expertise. I've read a lot about linguistics, but not as much as I've studied math. So, you know, if I make language episodes, it's closer to outside of my expertise that I need to study a lot of a specific thing to make sure that I get the episode accurate if I make a language one. Whereas if I make math ones, sometimes I'm sometimes I just like, what topic should I do today? Oh, let's do imaginary numbers. Okay, here we go. Because I have it pretty deep in the brain. Language ones, I have to double check a little more that I'm getting stuff correct with sources and such. So it's closer to out of my expertise, but I do like uh, linguistics and I know a bit about it. And if I ever make an episode about something, you can trust that I researched what, whatever's in that. Now, let me go. Okay, you had some sirens. They're coming for the clocks. So, uh, I'm going to go, not running from the sirens or anything. Definitely just checking if the cats and the strawberries are good. I will be back shortly, and we might do a little field trip.
All right, folks. For the final stage, possibly, of our stream, let's go visit a little strawberry. I couldn't see where the cats are at. Maybe I can call them back in. But... We'll go visit a interesting grown strawberry that appeared, just like I mentioned, as a traveler plant in a bunch of compost. Strawberry got eaten by a worm or isopod. It made the seed come out in part of the compost it put out, and there you go. Strawberries appear. So let's look for that. And somebody said, let's all pitch in and pay for an IQ test. If people really want to all band together and pay for an IQ test, they can, if they're that curious about what my IQ measurement is. It is such a specific measurement that I won't hold, I won't care that much what it says, but it would be interesting. I would be, it would be worth knowing for fun, even though it's not a valid measurement of intelligence. Why not know how good I am at that sort of pattern recognition? So if anyone ever wants to, they can. However, you know, if anyone wants to band together to help the combo dream in a clearer way, there is a Patreon and stuff like that where that money goes directly toward hiring people to help me make videos and make sure that we can get cool content every week. So I will say, if you're going to put $300 toward combo class, uh, it might make more sense to put it toward, as a group, the Patreon, where it'll go toward hiring my combo team and making cool content. Uh, but if you want to put it to an IQ test, it is your choice. Like I said, if anyone ever sends me a donation that is big enough for that and says this is only for an IQ test, I'll use it for that. All right. Now, let's take a little field trip. Now, our field trips are not very far. We're just going to the front yard. But, and there's a chance I'll have to uh, quiet down or move at some point if we're bugging neighbors or something. Oh, uh, man, you see this angle I'm talking about? When you're at the wrong angle of combo class, you just get part of it in the background. Eh, uh, I don't know. So... I'm actually going to mask us for a little bit. I'm going to shift us over for a bit. Sorry. There we go. You got to look at the cube rule for a second while we go over here. So that was what I happened to have on the screen. Now, here we go. This is the onion that grew. It looks like it's a crazy Dr. Seuss-like plant. And these are green onion-like sprouts that you can trim off. You can just pluck these and eat them. These ones look kind of yellowish for some reason. Here's one right here that looks good. You see this? You can pluck it off. It'll grow right back soon. And we can eat it. You know what else we can eat? These are the ones I called nasturtiums. One of my first words as a kid. Nasturtium. Nasturtium. Because I grew up in my childhood house as well. Because I thought it was cool that you're allowed to eat the flowers. The petals. Mm -hmm. You know what else you can eat? Mint. Mint grew in here. See this mint? I don't know if you can see it. This is a mint plant. Mint, you can eat that as well. You know what else you can eat? Strawberries grew. Now, let's just take the tiniest little strawberry out of them. How can I get this angle? I got it. It's hard, really hard to aim this. It's not a computer. Okay. Can you see the strawberry? There's the little strawberries, the little red things. And let's pick the littlest one. I hope you can see this. Well, a lot came off. It feels like simultaneously a little too old and a little too young. Like too much of the stem came off for what's normal, but it feels kind of wrinkly and old, like it needed to be plucked. So we got 
a very rare plant that just came in the compost. Now, we're going to see the compost in a minute, where this came from. But first, let's have a little strawberry. Oh my god, that's good. Now, our next thing we're going to see is the pineapple guava, which also has edible petals. This is a brief detour with one more type of edible petal. So here's the cool thing. It's about to be June, my favorite month. The reason June's my favorite month is because we get more plants or like fresh fruits and stuff and sunshine and fruits and stuff up here in the Northern hemisphere. But I don't want these little spindly parts. But here, when you eat the petals of this thing, they're edible even before the plants are ready. So now it's more like spring than summer but we get really cool edible things as well. Now, the final thing we're gonna have to see, I will, uh, let's see, we're gonna just put some strawberries in the background while we go over here, is this thing over here is not for the, um, I don't know what the right term is. It's a little gross. This is the compost bin. So I'm gonna be honest to anyone who doesn't wanna see stuff being like decomposed and eaten and stuff by bugs, and doesn't wanna see a lot of bugs, you might wanna leave and make sure to go back to the Combo Class channel uh, some point tonight or tomorrow to see a really cool episode. But we are gonna, for those who wanna see, look in here. So this is the top of what goes on in here. You see all those little creepy crawly guys? On the top, it's isopods. Little like roly-poly things. Now, they eat all that stuff, and then they turn it into more like decomposed stuff. And you get a lot of worms. Oh my God, look at all those worms. So, that's a lot of worms. Do you see all the worms? So, these worms are helping us decompose and get cool soil and turn things into strawberries and stuff. Now, worms are underrated. So let's remember that worms are helpful, good decomposers in our environment. Um, what we're actually gonna do is why don't we bring a worm or two and an isopod back to the combo classroom and put them into our little uh, planter bin because our planter bin could use a little extra good compost and soil. So I'm gonna take a little compost and a worm or two And we're going to bring these back to the Combo Classroom's planter. All right. Getting my final worm. And putting this back. Okay. Got a few worms and some soil. Now we're gonna go back to the combo classroom for a moment. All right, worm and soil. Uh, sorry, you guys gotta just see strawberries again for a second while I head back here. Oh, never mind. you know what you're gonna see? Okay, I'm putting the worms down for a second, sorry. Worms, we're coming back to get you in a minute. There's something that everyone requested. Okay, not everybody requested this, but I'm sure some people requested this. And his name is Dandelion. Dandelion. Dandelion's such a little angel. He is a creature of pure love. This is the fluffy one of the cats. He has some cameos in the next episode. He's so fluffy and he wanders through the wild that he gets all these little burrs in him. 
in there. We gotta get all your burrs out. You silly head. Dandelion. They're such good boys. Dandelion's also so sweet that he's really accepting of the new stray cat, Sassafras, who we adopted like a year ago. Dandelion doesn't care whatever he does and follow him and stuff. So Sassafras just follows Dandelion now and copies him. And Dandelion's a good role model. Oh, do you want to flop out? He loves flopping out and getting his belly rubbed too. Here we go, yeah. You can like flop him out and rub his belly and he loves it. Dandelion is so cool. He's also really silly. He does funny things and just like flops out for your attention and runs around in a goofy way. So if I'm in a dark mood, Dandelion always cheers me up. That's a good Dandelion. Now, we're going to go back to the combo classroom in a minute, Dandelion, but you could follow us back there if you want. Sometimes he comes back there, but he's more comfortable out in the front yard. So, Dandasaur, we're going to head back here. And maybe we can get him to follow. Dandy. Dandy. Okay, he's following, yay. Okay. Dandelion. Dandelion here. That's a good boy. He came for more love here in the combo classroom. Dandy. Also, check out the dice carpet. Going pretty good. We're getting our dice embedded every time it rains. They form this new dice carpet. So, the, the, this is the little bonus of the combo life of having all my fun cats around as a distraction. As you know, although I like teaching and learning, if I see a squirrel, I get distracted and the same as with the cat. If I see one of my cats, they can absorb me into love for a while. And Dandelion is such a sweetheart. I wish you guys could pet Dandelion's stomach. He's so nice. Now, Dandelion, you can come over here if you want. Oh no, it's so crowded with weird junk over here. I'm not surprised he doesn't want to come over here. Okay. So, where'd you go, Dan? Oh, there you are. Dandelion. Okay, he's down there somewhere. I'm gonna log off the stream before long. Thank you all. Somebody said, make sure I have a chance to get my video edited. Don't worry, it's gonna take me many hours. The reason I say tonight or tomorrow, I'm kind of joking about me procrastinating on it. It's gonna take me like five more hours or something to have it all done. And I know I'm gonna do that at some point tonight or tomorrow, but spending like one more hour on the stream does not actually affect, the, you know, on a big scale, the five hours I need to do of editing before the episode's out. So, uh, and yes, Dandelion is to a degree the combo class mascot, as the Magic Fellow says. We have a good little picture of him on the Discord. You can comment on posts. We need to get a picture of Sage, my other cat. And maybe we'll have a good one in the next episode because, oh, we have the cutest Sage cameo of all time. Okay, yeah, you'll just have to wait to see the next episode. You think Dandelion's a sweetheart? Well, wait till you see the other cat that's tied for as much of a sweetheart as him, but is a different shape and size and such. But his brother is just as sweet as him. So we're going to um, get cameos from all the cats in the next episode, or at maybe not the little stray dude Sassafras, even though he is such a sweetheart. We at least get Sage and Dandy in the next episode. So, thank you all for joining me with all of this random stuff in our second half of the stream. I think I'm going to log off before too long. And 
If you have any final questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, what you can expect is that combo class, it, we're going to keep having our content get better and better, but some of these episodes will require me a week and a half or so. And we have a lot of interesting topics coming out on the main combo class channel, as well as I've been putting a lot of shorts there. So after the stream, if you haven't yet, make sure you look in the description here and there are five shorts that I've listed that were on that channel. And the newest one, I bet most of you haven't seen because the newest one I just put out like yesterday. And I didn't put it to subscription or notification feeds. I just put it to the shorts page and for to this notification right here in the description. And on this channel, I don't want to promise anything particular because we'll do a lot of interesting things in June. June's my favorite month. I'll, we'll see when the content lands, but I know that I love June. It is a time of se uh, seasonal growth and the summer and such up here. And it also does happen to be the month when it is my birthday, uh, which I liked as a kid, which made me like it more. And which this year means I will be turning 30 but I'm not going to say the exact date in case there's any creepy people. I won't give them a head start, but my birthday, I will be turning 30 in June. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to be any uh, less wild or less experimental or curious or whatever in our thirties. If, oh, squirrel. If anything, we'll only be more experimental and curious in section R30s as I'm getting more sure that this can be my job and I can spend more and more time showing you all cool stuff. So, um, to whoever mentioned base 10, I can't fully go into it. You say you can go into five, but it can't go into three. So I want you to think about why is it more important to go into five than into three. And to whoever asked our lives weekly, I was doing them every Monday. I will maybe sometimes try and do them on each Monday. What's my evening around five or 6 PM Pacific. That might be a more likely time I'll do them, but I don't want to promise a weekly stream during this month. And so this month, we're going to have to maybe just have the lives announced about a day before, sometimes more, sometimes less. This one was announced, for example, maybe two hours before it was scheduled. And I'll try and schedule some of my ideas that I want to do live streams for a bit early. So you have like a day or two time of if you were on the channel or hopefully homepage, you'd see it's coming. But I, I'm not going to do weekly live streams this week. If anyone ever, um, if I have somebody ever on my team, which I cannot afford the budget to like hire right now, but if, if I have someone on my team ever who can help me run the tech on the live streams every single time and other similar things like doing timestamps after, then I could do them multiple times a week and I may in the future. I, at some point in the future, there will probably be a weekly combo show. However, June, I'm going to keep it a little more free form. There will be a lot of content though. So even if you miss the lives, remember that within half a day, hopefully less, I will have time stamped the live. I try and always do it before the HD and chat takes to process anyway, because when I do a live stream right after the SD is available, like the standard definition, but the high def version and the chat take a while for YouTube to process. And so I always try and have them timestamped by the time that hits, but hopefully earlier. So if you ever miss a stream, you can always watch it like half a day later and then you'll have like the chat, the HD and some timestamps. Now I'm not going to answer to whoever's guessing. Feel free to guess a uh, fun game. And I'm sure the thing is, it's like you can get data about anyone you want online, but if anyone finds my birthday or whatever, 
finds anything. They find my address. They find my social security number, whatever. Let's just not share it with each other as a joke because it is possible to track anyone down in the world if you have the right resources. And let's not give any creepy people any head starts. If anybody wants to help the combo classroom and emails me, I'll probably let them visit the combo classroom. I'm not, you know, hiding my realm or whatever. People can come visit me if they want. However, let's not give any creepy people a head start on any birthdays or addresses or anything. We do have a private mailbox for those who want to send anything. So, you know, that's in the description. And I think I am going to log off pretty soon now that we've done... I mean, my original topic was like an hour and a half ago, and we've done quite a bit of creative, free philosophical time as well. In fact, this is maybe not the longest stream. It, hmm, I wonder if this is the longest stream I've ever done. It, there's a chance that this is the longest. It is in the top three longest streams I've done. And checking real quick on the Demotro channel, it is close to 139 subscribers. It's going to pass that in a few hours, probably. Crazy. I, oh my God. It's just like really crazy. I, I've worked a long time my whole life with different ideas that I've thought maybe one of these someday people outside my friend group will understand. But I'm not a good like digital marketer or anything. And I was kind of shy with some of my older things I released under other forms online. And with combo class, it's a long story, but I, after I almost died in 2021 and then I had to get two surgeries in 2022 and all this insane stuff, I was just like, well, let's just go extra hardcore on trying to help the world with combo class and just being myself and just making a lot of content. And it's been working surprisingly fast. Uh, I knew that if I pushed my ideas long enough that they would work in the form of they would get people to watch them. I don't care about the money. Like, it's really cool that it can be my job. That's really, really good. But it, I don't like money. I don't like thinking about it. And I mean, I like it because it makes me able to make ideas come out, but I don't like thinking about it. And so... Uh, what I care about is how many people get to see my ideas and or sometimes, you know, my phrasing of a classic idea and getting to where we are right now happens so quick. This channel's first video came out nine, less than nine months ago. This channel's first video, because I did a stream a little bit ago about how this channel was created nine months from that stream, but I hadn't posted any videos yet. This channel's first video that was ever put on this channel was less than nine months ago still. So nine months from tomorrow. Crazy. Now the Combo Class channel is about a year old, but still so incredibly new. So I'm so glad that so many people have joined me on this awesome journey. And I promise you all that I do have even cooler ideas planned for the future. Really unbelievably, I, I'm worried that if I ever ex try and express how grateful I am, that I'm just going to like cry or something. So I'll probably have to leave it at that. But I genuinely am really grateful for everyone here. Now... Lots of cool extra comments. Maybe I'll follow up on those in the next stream. For now, we're probably going to log off. Had a lot of different types of fun in this stream. I will add timestamps at some point soon, but it's this was a really long stream. If any awesome viewers want to add any timestamps as soon as this SD comes out in a minute, as soon as I end the stream, the SD comes out. If anyone wants to comment any timestamps of their favorite moments or the moment I started a random topic, That'll be kind of helpful because, you know, if you if you do all of them, I'll pin your comment. 
or if you use some of them, I'll incorporate that into when I have to timestamp it. it. Takes me a while to skim back through these streams and uh, save all the best moments for future viewers. But uh, that's part of why I want to hire someone else or have another team member to do that. Because while they're running the stream, they can be taking notes about that stuff. So I don't have to re-go through the stream. But uh, I'll have fun going through the stream. I'll see some squirrels and stuff. Now, make sure, I know I've said this before, but make sure you're tuned into all the cool links in the description that include the new shorts on the Combo Class channel, the newest Golden Ratio episode, and in general that you know that the Combo Class channel is kind of my main channel, and this is my bonus channel that got out of hand. And uh, also be tuned into the Discord if you want to chat to people the subreddit if you want to post funny memes or comments or whatever, and the Patreon if you're really extra helpful and if you happen to have any extra money, we'll use it for good use. Um, I promise. Uh, but if you don't, I understand. Now, uh, June will be even cooler. It might be more less predictable when I say the content. I might like do a little less promising. This day, this thing's coming out. But there's going to be a lot of cool content in June. So I love you all so much. Remember that uh, there's plenty of content to rewatch and a lot of cool places to chat in those links. And I'll be back before long. Most importantly, with the main channel episode coming out tonight or tomorrow, that will be about a cool type of graph theory question that has a surprisingly simple unsolved question in math. It's going to be about a 20 minute episode, maybe 19 minutes, because it, it has a lot of different things I go into there. So, you know, if you're a true combo lord, remember this channel I want you to see as the when I have time for videos and the combo class channel I want you to see as, oh, I should watch all these within a couple days of them coming out channel. That's where I put my really extra good stuff. So even though this channel's extra more popular, Remember, if you have to categorize in your mind, always watch Combo Class. When I have time, watch Demotro channel. So, love you all so much. 